Maayong hapon ka na tong tanan. You are watching Amistad Duradera Lecture Series Part 2, broadcasting live from Cebu City, Philippines. Maayong hapon. Wow, it's good to see that our on-site audience are all smiling and I hope the same is true with our virtual audiences. Hi there from the city of Cebu. If you don't know, we are live streaming through the platforms of the National Historical Commission, University of San Jose Recoletos, National Kensentennial Celebrations, the page of Cebu City Government's Cultural and Historical Affairs Office, as well as for our local um, LHCN, which is a network of different organizations advocating culture and heritage. To recall, earlier this morning, we already had three lectures, one from our keynote speaker and two from our guest lecturers. To give you a little bit of background, the topic of our keynote speaker, architect Melva Hava, was on Cebu 10 years after the 2013 earthquake. We also had Mr. or Dr. George Emmanuel Borinaga from the Department of Anthropology, Sociology, and History. And he talked about the different deities in Visayas before and after Christianization. And to complete our roster of speakers in the morning session, we also had Professor Delilah Labajo, who talked about the Holy Infant Child or the devotion to Senor Santo Nino. And this afternoon, we also have two speakers who will be sharing two lectures for today. Without further ado, I would like to introduce to you to our fourth lecturer for today and also the first lecturer for this afternoon. Our first lecturer for this afternoon is from the Archdiocese Commission for Cultural Heritage of the Archdiocese of Cebu. He is also a commissioner of the Cebu City Cultural and Historical Affairs Office. Ladies and gentlemen, both physically present and virtually present, let us all welcome Reverend Father Brian Brigoli. Mayong hapon sa tenen. Most especially to our distinguished guest from the NHCP, Sir Alvin, Sir Jerwill, Architect Melva, from the USJR, to ang mga kaparian, mga estudyante. Huwag ka natong tenen. Maayong hapon once again. This uh, paper entitled Pamanang Espanyol, the Hispanic Influences in the Ecclesiogenesis of the Church Cultural Heritage of Cebu. This presents the many layers of the Hispanic influences in the ecclesiological structure of the local church of Cebu. Its main focus is the tangible heritage and both the immovables and the movables. These influences are very much extant in today's time and are still in use today by the local churches. The generality of these influences is under the classification of the sacred arts or ars sacra in the service of the mission of the church in general. Be it in the forms of edifices or architecture, paintings or prints, masonry or reliefs, textiles or metals, these are the visible signs if not the living testimonies of the Hispanic influences in the local church of Cebu under the vortex of ecclesiastical arts or art sacra. However, these ecclesiastical works of art are always at the service of evangelization. For sacred arts have in themselves evangelizing capacities that can aid soul for the encounter of beauty himself. Sacred art or art sacra expresses the highest manifestation of a divine truth. It captures what mere words cannot express. It becomes the visible sign of an, invisible, of an invisible, reality. invisible reality. More so, More sacred, so art sacred art translates, translates passage of faith, of faith into, into a tangible, tangible reality, reality of an otherwise incomprehensible religious truth. This truth. For so indeed, so sacred, indeed art sacred art has its evangelizing power that proclaims divine realities through the encounter of beauty. Every local church has its beginning and birthing. 
This is referred to as the ecclesiogenesis. The term is coined by two different terms. First, ecclesiology, which is the study of the nature, structure, and the function of the church within the given community. However, the term genesis refers to the origin or the beginning. And that's why we have the first book in the uh, Bible, the Genesis, no, in the beginning. Thus, the term ecclesiogenesis refers to the origin and the uh, development of a local church and their structures over time, such as the ecclesiogenesis of the uh, Cebu church. This paper traces the Hispanic influences within the limits of the ecclesiastical realms, which focuses on the aspect of church arts. These works of art that spring forth from the Hispanic times introduced to the local church over time have indeed intrinsic evangelizing power that inspire the faithful to search, to search for God and for the maturity of faith. Every aspect of the church art is meant to inspire, instruct, and catechize the faith. The Hispanic influences in the local church of Cebu and even perhaps the other local churches in the other location of the nation with Hispanic pasts are concretely evident in the edifices being built as well as the accoutrements of sacred liturgy. They are indeed the sublime expressions of the sacred arts that, that possess evangelizing valence. This is still what it is today. People are continuing to be inspired Instructed and catechized to the sacred, to the sacred parts, parts of the church, of the church where, the where the Spaniards had brought our shores, our shores 500, 500 or, so or so years ago. However, the However, very, the very origin, origin of this is the faith, the faith being, being introduced, introduced by the Catholic, by the Catholic colonizers, colonizers in our land. This is the, this is the, the Ignatian Genesis of the Philippine, the Philippine church. church. In Cebu, we take pride, pride, pride of the very of first baptism. baptism. We celebrated, we celebrated uh, uh, baptism, baptism to be celebrated, celebrated where it made a couple, couple hundred, hundred converts, of converts embracing the Christian faith. From henceforth, this young church never fails to grow, not only in its sheer number of faithful, but as well as the constitution of the local church, its structure, governance, and even the growth of the uh, of the local church from a diocese up to becoming an archdiocese, and later on giving birth to another two dioceses no, in the in the Archdiocese of Cebu. Since we are preparing for the Sugbu Swak, no, from one Archdiocese, it gives birth to another diocese, the north and the south. No? Uh, nanganak yud, no? <laughs> nanaghan yud. As atupa, there is life and there is growth. As for the outline of the presentation, we tackle the main aspects of the church complex where the works, where the of, works art of art are even are evenly manifested, manifested and, expressed. and expressed. Then we proceed, we proceed in discussing its theological and cultural needs in reference to the church, to the church mission, mission for evangelization. evangelization. However, However, the, the kind of, kind of introduction, introduction that I'm going to give to you since, to you, since this is just, just an introduction. Mga college student, mana mo'y subject, introduction to philosophy, introduction to theology. Mahuma na lang ang semester, introduction, lagi hapon mo kutub, no? Mora sa ni nga talk, no? Ay mo kahibong, puro yung introduction ini. <laughs> this is actually to give you the value of the sacred arts that the Spanish, um, uh, the Hispanic, as a uh, important Hispanic influence that had been introduced to the birthing of a church. Other than the architectural genre of our uh, built structures and built heritage, we focus on the evangelizing power of the sacred art that somehow being present today, still doing its mandate to inspire people to evangelize, to teach the faith through visuals, to teach the faith through structures, and to teach the faith with the iconographic programs that the church uh, is embracing since then and even up to now. Now, let me um, borrow this uh, very inspiring words of um, St. Paul John, uh, St. John Paul II. No? In his apostolic letter, uh, he said, By its very nature, faith tends to express itself in artistic forms and historical testimony having an intrinsic evangelizing power and cultural value to which the church is called to pay the greatest attention. 
nga diha sa mga mugna sa arte na adinha ang pagtuo nga gitudlo sa simbahan nga hangtod karon ug ang pagtuo nga maka-inspire kanato uh, ug ang pagtuo nga giprotektahan usab sa simbahan in its uh, visible and tangible manifestations in its cultural heritage now since this is an introduction kanita stas og outline pero introduction na gyapon ni tanan <laughs> we have the ecclesiogenesis and uh, we have the Casa de Dios of Stone and Timber, a built heritage. We have the Retablos of Statues and Shells. We have the Ornamentos of Worship and Sacred Objects, the Navi of Pews and Floors, El Cuadro of Paints and Images, Porta Mayor of Wood and Doors, the Estaciones de la Cruz of Reliefs and Stations, and lastly, the Conclusion. May ganit kayo na conclusion di ay. Now, the Casa de Dios of stone and timber, a built heritage. God's house is overflowing with meanings. From a simple carved relief at the facade to a towering height of a bell tower, church structures underlined what the church believes. Every aspect of the physical church explains a theological value. Nothing that is incorporated in it has no relation to the tenets of the faith. Every single carving, every religious sign and symbol ultimately direct the mind and heart to the contemplation of the divine. The colonial church structures are usually constructed of masonry, especially of lime and cut stones, cal y canto in Spanish. These structures, other than its practical uses, have in themselves intrinsic narratives in expressing faith that evangelizes. For over hundreds of years, the structures stand as a living memorial to the enduring faith of the Cebuano faithful that proves to be resilient to the test of times, like the stones of these churches that still stood strong. Church buildings speak of the durability, not only of its fabric, but more so of the resolute belief of the community. Let me borrow the words of um, Richard Taylor in his book, How to Read a Church, A Guide to Symbols and Images in Churches and, Cath and Cathedrals. Churches are packed with meanings. Outside the spire points heavenwards. Carvings around the entrance announce the holiness of the space inside. The scenes in the stained glass point to aspects of Christian teachings about God. In a number of senses and to different degrees, churches were built to be read. Church complex. Church complex, or complejo de la iglesia in Spanish, consists of numerous built structures at the service of the religious and the social life. Kay ang simbahan sa ona, dili lang kini lugar kung asa magampo ang mga tao, pagpadayag silang pagtuo to celebrate the sacraments. But this is, this was also considered to be a fortification to really, to protect the Christian faithful from the enemies, no? That's why they are built in such a way that they are like military fortifications. They have walls, they have sentries, they have cannon towers, and even the construction of the churches, thick walls and small um, openings. These are somehow reflected in how the Catholic Church wanted to defend the lifestyle and the cultural patterns of the Christians during the time against our enemies. That's why in the seat of both the ecclesiastical and civil authority that govern a particular community, this is composed of church, rectory, plaza, um, mga plaza, kabayan yun nasa simbahan, pero karon ng ubang plaza, naanas gobyerno. <laughs> Escuela Catolica, Campo Santo, and uh, many others. For the civil authority, this consists of the Casa Real, uh, Casa de Justicia, and the like. Church facade. The facade or the pachada in Spanish is the face of the church, bayhon sa simbahan, no? ang hulagway sa simbahan. It has its opportunity to teach, inspire, catechize those who linger upon it. It preludes to the mystical inside the church, perchance for a pilgrim to gaze upon the divine from the realm of the mundane. This is the old pachada of the cathedral, this is the new this is after the uh, bombing in World War II, where the main, this is the only uh, original and the belfry. The rest are 
already knew. This is the church facade of the of Talisay Parish, whose feast we're going to celebrate this coming Sunday. No, kibamo asa mo mamista rong Domingo, no. And also, this is the pachada of uh, Pardo Parish. Okay. Now let's go to the convent. Convent, convento or casa parroquial in Spanish is the building for the parish priest's residence or rectory. It is also where the oficina parroquial is located. Convent serves as home of the parish priest within the community where he lives among the people whom he ministers and serves. No, this is part of the mandate of the priest to serve in the community that they are going, that we are going to live uh, with the community. Now, mauna nga ang pare na agay kumbinto. Kung naga ni parokya nga way kumbinto, delikado na. Mangita naglaing kumbinto, lain ng balay kada adlaw. No? <laughs> mauna, mangita gimog pare ato gius kumbinto, ayos laing balay. <laughs> now, let's go to the, this is the convent of um, Sibunga. This is a very beautiful convent of Bolhoon. Another Fiesta upcoming this coming November. No, ginahan mo mamista, ilista ni tanang pistas parokya aron layo rang napu katuig nato. <laughs> now let's go to the cemetery. This is called the Campo Santo in Spanish. This is a holy ground for those faithful who passed away. Originally, this is situated at the vicinity of the church, such as in Bulhoon. We have uh, we have that um, to indicate the communion of both the living and the dead, where the living can pray for the dead and the dead can intercede for the living. Where the Campo Santo is considered to be a hallowed ground. No? Muna nga ang matuang mga patay nga nagpaabot sa kabanhawan, ana na ito ilubong, kung din usab kita, naglantaw sa atong panahon, kung kanusa sa damo abot, kanusa sa damo abot, nga kita mahiusa diha kanila. No? This is part of our faith. This is part of our being church. And then, this is the uh, Campo Santo of um, Kalamba. This one is very unique in Sibunga. Kaning tunga nga structure, dako na siya nga dome diha. Anyway, natabunan na siya og mga vegetation. But that's uh, one of a kind in the Archdiocese of Cebu. In Laguna, uh, in Kalamba, Laguna naman noon. In Kalamba, we have we still have the the Capilla, no, mortuario. And a very unique one is in Bulhoo, no? And you will be greeted with iconographic, uh, iconographic program that would uh, point of the nature of the place, no? Calabera and uh, crossbones and the skull. And this is also in, no, sorry, this is not in Calamba, but this is already in Oslob. Okay, Oslob na siya. Now let's go to the belfry. A bell tower, campanario in Spanish, is a structure that houses bells that toll for the liturgical celebrations of the church. It is towering landmark of a place marking the location of the church. No? Karon tag-as pa man sad ang mga signages ni, ni Jalibi, ni Andox. No? Usahe mo, mula bawpas ato ang kampanaryo, pero generally taas gyapon atong kampanaryo. No? And that is a landmark. No? Pangita kag simbahan, pangita ang kampanaryo. No? Ay mo pangita og cell site. <laughs> <laughs> Pero karon mangita kag lungsod, pangita ka Imlolier, pangita ka Julis, kung makita kay mo naa ka sa sintro. <laughs> now this is uh, uh, another old um, picture of the old church in Mabolo, uh, neo gothic in in its uh, genre, no? Now let's go to the retablos of the of statues and shells. Retable or retablo in Spanish is a decorative screen behind the altar table. It is sometimes referred to as the altar piece. This is not the altar, but this is the altar piece. No, the altar is the table, which is the most prominent uh, fixture in the church that makes up what a church is. No, kung nindot ang simbahan, kung wai altar table di na simbahan. Pero kung nai altar table, bisag wak pa nai atop, wak pa nai bungbung simbahan na na, no. And therefore, it is the altar table as the most prominent. Um, fixture in the church. The retablo is only the altar piece. It's the background of the altar table. The niches for the crucifix as well as the saints are incorporated in the retablo where they are elaborately decorated with motif. Retablo always points to whom the church is dedicated to. Kinaaman diha ang mga dibulto sa mga patron. 
for the statue of the patron saint is always enshrined either at the center niche or at the side adorned with a decorative bouquet in shell, lagang in Cebuano, or other material, ramillete in Spanish. They're rich in iconographic value, both the patron saints and the faith in general. They evangelize through signs and symbols depicted at the statues and motif. Before, before the adjournment of the Vatican II, ang nagyud sa main niche is the patron or the patrona, no? Just like we have in Karkar, we have in Mabolo. It's only then that with the arjunamento at the center niche is already the crucifix, no? Now, what na nato na usba kay that's already a heritage um, consideration. Ang mga mga statue sa uh, patron o patrona na sa main niche ang um, liturgically gi compensate nan siya o crucifix beside the altar kanang gamay nga crucifix uh, mga serialis mo na siya mo na siya insinsuhan because in the sanctuary there is a triad there the crucifix at the center the altar table and the tabernacle this uh, these elements speak of one mystery no at the crucifix we are um, recalled to the ultimate um, suffering the ultimate self-abasement of Jesus, while the altar table is the bloodless memorial of that crucifixion. And the tabernacle as the heart that beats within the, the church where it has the component of the sacramental or the real presence of our Lord. No? That's the triad, the crucifix, the altar table, and the tabernacle. It's not only, it's not also uh, about the appropriateness of signs kung imong crucifix, um, kanang resurrected Christ no although it's a christian symbol but not appropriate no kinahanglan kanag yung Ginoo nga gilansang di pud siguro Ginoo nga gilansang pero ang dagway mura og gigilukan no wa man i kasakit atong makit-an ining statua a statuha no muna it's very, it matters a lot the sacred arts of the church as a means for evangelization for inspiration Now, the crucifix niche, the crucifix or the crucifijo in Spanish, is an image of the crucified Christ pointing to the bloodless sacrifice at the altar table in memory of the crucifixion at the Calvary as the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus for the salvation of humankind. This is the prominent image that directs the soul to the mystery of the Eucharist, and not only the Eucharist, but to the Paschal mystery. The Blessed Virgin Mary niche, this is the... Uh, now, before this is ret the retablo in Bulhoon, no? you will never find the crucifix there at the center. While in the cathedral, since this is an adaptation of the old retablo, nana ang mandate sa Vatican II where the crucifix is at the center. The left is the Mama Mary or the Blessed Virgin Mary niche, and the right is the patron saint niche. No? This is the hierarchy of image in the retablo. No? Dina niyo po ide kanang balibalihon depending usang buwan aton is lang i, <laughs> i raffle no o, sunod buwan lai na pod mm. sunod hantod ni ang Paris Priest na magbarog di asnitso no okay now the blessed Mar mary uh, virgin mary niche the ave maria niche is intended for the statue of the blessed virgin mary enshrined at the left side of the crucifix in reference to the crucifix recreating the scene of the crucifixion where the mother of jesus stayed at the foot of the cross the patron saint's niche the patron saint niche is intended for a particular saint to whom the church is dedicated to the statue of the patron saint is enshrined at the right side of the crucifix while this one in badian karaan man si santiago nga nagkabayo na asa tunga no Pero kinyong tanahon, mas prominent ang dagway sa kabayo kaysa dagway ni <laughs> Santiago. <laughs> Muna kung nasakit, nasakit inyong kabayo, ipahid lang inyong kamot sa kabayo, diha, sa uh, retablo. Hopefully, maayo inyong kabayo. No? <laughs> kabayo, desplansya, dinay kabayo nga mananap. No? The tabernacle. The tabernacle or the tabernaculo or the sagrario in Spanish is a shrine or a miniature structure where the Blessed Sacrament is kept and reserved. This speaks of the sacramental presence of the Lord Jesus. The adornments always indicate to the sacrament of the Eucharists. 
na daghan ni Akani this is a tabernacle found in the Archdiocese and Museum of Cebu but its provenance is from the parish of Carmen this is made of silver and bronze no mo na igadto ninyo ay taw ninyo kuskusa no kay bisag inyo ning kuskuson manipis in town ni no okay now floor tiles the baldosas in spanish are earthenware floor tiles generally square in shape used both at the sanctuary and the nave areas this indicates the virtue of humility, humus in Latin or ground in English, needed upon entering the house of God to encounter Him in a contrite heart. To be grounded of who we are before God, that we are His beloved children, is primarily the foundation of the virtue of humility. That's why we find the baldosas uh, laid out in the sanctuary area and also the nave area. Okay. Now, gani kini sa argaw at the front of the pachada na adin he tiles nga na ay symbol of the sun, which indicates the Godhead, no? And these are the patterns found in the heritage churches. Uh, the left is from Bantayan, the right is from Hinatilan. The left is from Pardo, and the simple one, the simplest one, is in Karkar, in the right side. It varies in different patterns, but they're all made of earthenware floor, they're earthenware floor tiles. The ornamentos of worship and sacred objects. Now we're going into the uh, movable, tangible um, heritage. Ganina, we are in the immovable. Church liturgy is rich in signs and symbols imbued with theological meanings. From the accoutrements of the ministers, Obspari, mga vestments, to the collections of the sacred vessels point to a mystery that made visible and comprehensible by the signs and symbols translated into works of arts. Sacred vestments, ornamentos of different colors and motifs signal the different liturgical seasons and functions, no? Dili na ni kung sa gusto spari nga color mo yang sulubo no, it follows a strict liturgical mandate, no? Anto na lang, rainbow na lang amoy soul of any. <laughs> okay, now, this will be a celebrations of the church, no? the liturgical seasons. Statues of different iconographic representations instruct the faithful about the heroic deeds of the saints worthy of emulation. That's why even statues or dibolto have their own iconographic programs. No? That means it speaks of the virtue of the saint or the patronage of the saint, no? Sama ni Santa Lucia, magdaog mata. No? Sa ito pa, it signals to us nga siya mo'y patrona sa mga tao nga masakiton og mata. No? Kung ang iyong pananaw, puro nilang gwapo o gwapa, add mo ni Santa Lucia. No? Or pu pwede na po din yung mga pananaw, pwede na, pu puro na sa mga ngilad, kana daot na na inyong mata. <laughs> now, liturgical vestments. Sacred vestments or ornamentos in Spanish are worn by priests in the celebration of the Holy Eucharist and performing other liturgical functions. These vestments are rich in iconographic signs of the mystery of the Eucharist. Because this is the only way that the church can wield its somehow a kind of a power, of a divine power. Because if it's a military, then we are going to wield in your, in your hardwares, no? Yung aeroplano, mga tanki de gira, mga armory, etc. But this is how the church would express its mandate of power, no? By work of arts. Work of arts that inspire, that catechize, and would somehow lead our minds and hearts to prayer and to the encounter of the divine artisan. Liturgical vessels. Sacred vessels, the vasos sagrados in Spanish, are metal receptacles reserved for the celebration of the Mass and other liturgical functions. These are the chalice, the paten, siburio, monstrance, ostensorium, and many others, which are consecrated and blessed. No? Una nga, kung mag mo, ay taon niyo gamitang chalice o tagay, ha? Or ang, or ang mumpo na lang sa Diyod, may aron kausahaw na lang tanig pangayag pasaylo, mumpol na sa itagay. O aron usahaw na lang yun, o mangayag pasaylo, ang ustiya na lang sa himoon nga sumsuman. Unsan naman yun ang inyo? At least do almost langit, no? 
Kung naay mga sa Kristan diri pangutan as lag ilaban nang nabuhat for sure siguro na as lag ilaha mga sugilanon. <laughs> Religious statues, sacred statues, ribulto, dibulto or di bastidor or di gonse are carved images or busts as reminders of God, the Blessed Virgin Mary and the saints. The church has taught that the Christian veneration of images is not contrary to the first commandment which proscribes idols. In our Catechism at Catholic Church, we are told that the honor rendered to an image passes to its prototype. And whoever venerates an image venerates the person portrayed in it. No? The honor paid to sacred images is a, respect, a respectful veneration, not the adoration due to God alone. No? This is our defense uh, against our separated brethren about iconoclasm. No? We are not actually adoring images. No? That is a respectful veneration because adoration is only due to God. Even the Blessed Virgin Mary, it's not adoration, but that's also a veneration, but higher to the veneration paid to the uh, saints. Now, pulpito, pulpit or pulpito in Spanish is an elevated platform attached to a wall where priests can preach. The canopy above, kanang iang canopy, uh, tornavos in Spanish, acts as a sounding board that amplifies the voice of the minister. No, may microphone sa ona kaning tornavos, uh, tornavos mo siya amplifier. No, kimo ni sang tangtangon dili mo amplify ang tingog ni padre. No, may nang naa siya tornabos aron ipangasaba ni padre kitang tanan makadungog siyang kasaba pero di sa kasabot kay Espanyol man no no tawag ng tagkaraho pero unsa man na no <laughs> okay the signs and symbols point to the liturgy of the word mostly that of the four evangelists and the holy spirit because this picture is at the service of the word that's why we have the ambo already at the elevation of the sanctuary where it is, uh, where its uh, iconographic programs point to the evangelists, to the Word, and even to the Holy Spirit, because th these are the appropriate signs and symbols of this uh, ambo. This is the pulpit in Bolhoon. This is the pulpito in Argao. Okay. Bells, church bells, campana in Spanish, are rung for variety of ceremonial purposes. They call the community to pray, to celebrate, to remember the dead, and to be warned by an impending danger. Bells yield historical information in the inscription, such as the bell's date of casting, the name of the parish priest when it was cast, for some, the name of the town it was commissioned, and most especially the name of the saint to which the bell is dedicated. Kaya mga bell na sila ilang mga patron. The weight of the bell is also indicated in pounds. If you found words such as libras or arobas, these are measurement, uh, these are uh, unit of measurement. And even bells are very good um, primary source. They can yield um, historical information. May bong mo nga nga mong bell, patron man sa pikas, pikas parokya. It so happened nga ang imong parokya Daughter parish ni Anto Maong Parokya, unya, it's a customary that the mother parish would give bell to the daughter parish, bringing with the information about the parish of the, the, the mother parish, ang iyahang patron, no? even the name of the parish priest, unya, ato ihatag. Mingunoy, nasaag na yung bell, actually, ila na, nagihatag na sa ilang mother parish. Okay, now this is an old bell in Malabuyok. This is called the Rueda. Kemutuyok man siya. It's with the yoke. It's the counterweight. Onya kaning osa at the left is fixed. And this is a new adaptation of uh, bells in in cathedral. No, this is called the um, Carillion bells. No, it's automated. No, automated. Um, inig strike sa hour mo strike pud siya. Inig kaalas dosi mo strike pud siya dosi ka buok, no. Or this is program, alas dosi, mukanta ni Angelus, ni kalas stress, la inasad nga kantahon, ni kalas utsus gabi, mang hadlok na ni ninyo, kay mugawas na ang mga kalag, no? Muna hipos na mo. Pero karon di naman mo to ang mga batan on, no? Kay sila na may ungo, no? Sa una, mahadlok, mamig ungo, mga batan on. Pero karon mga batan on, kamo na ungo sa karong nga panahon, no? 
Nga kami mga tiguang mahadlok na. <laughs> Now, pipe organs. The pipe organ or the organo in Spanish is a musical instrument with a keyboard in which sound is produced by air being forced into the pipes. This instrument became a center part of the worship and the liturgical celebrations of the community in churches. This is considered the, the instrument of the gods. No? It accompanies in all musicam sacram at the service of creating celebration of divine liturgical and religious worship. Now this is in Bolhoon. This is one of the three historical pipe organs restored through the effort of NHCP, Uh, the Archdiocese of Cebu, and also the Department of Tourism. Ang pinakakaraan, ang, ang tulo ini, Argao, Bulhoon, o Dalaget. Ang pinaka-unique is ang Argao. Okay, we believe that this is made by the locals. Kaya man siya ay marka. While in Dalaget and in Bulhoon, um, Oturel, no? Sa to pa, open na ang Swiss Canal for importation. But in Argao, wala pa to'y mga importation mo na nga. Ang naghimo o pipe organ sa Bohol might be the same um, workers who created the uh, pipe organ in Argao. And then it was a very successful uh, project because the Argao pipe organ was silent for almost 50 years. No? Uh, in, in 2018, before the pandemic, we were able to restore it and that's the first time after then, the almost 50 years of being silent, the pipe organ or argao is now functioning. No? Ilan na siya lang, ilan ang gamiton kada semana. And we are still um, doing its regular cleaning, part of the conservation effort of Archdiocese of Cebu and its CP. Ah, uh, Archdiocese of Cebu and in its CP. Unique sa ning argao, kaya na na siya ay anghel sa ibabaw, no? Na na siya ay bell nga gida, no? Na siya ay, na siya ay sikrito nga birahon o niya mutingog ang bell sa anghel. Unya na ni siya nga si pitot. <laughs> Mura og adaptation to the word potot. <laughs> si pitot. Okay. Navi or the of pews and floors. Every area of the church has a definitive purpose and meaning. Nothing in it is created by chance. The church plan is the most curated edifice. One can understand the tenets of the church just by understanding the, her structure and layout. A nave, or navi in Spanish, ship in English, is the longitudinal body of the church which resembles a ship. For a church, she is in a spiritual journey, the ark of salvation. In the same way, nave is symbolic to a mother's womb, taguangkan, that speaks of a nurturing environment. Thus, the church is always referred to as Mater Ecclesia or Mother Church. No? Tanang mother na amang yung itaguangkan. Katulang nagtakuban nga mama mo, ito yung itaguangkan. No? <laughs> the nave has two sides. The side to the right of the main altar is Lado de la Epistola or the Epistle side. To the left is Lado de la Evangelio or the Gospel side. Colonial churches are commonly laid in a cruci form, crucero in Spanish, or in a shape of a cross where both sides are called transept and the crossing at the center. This layout reminds us of Christ's in the cross. Let me borrow the words of the Sacrosanctum Concilium, number 124, exhorts that when a church is to be built, great care is to be taken that it is well suited for celebrating liturgical services and to bring about the full, active, and conscious participation of the faithful. This is the cathedral, no? It's a ship-like, and this is um, um, the terminal, terminology specific to the architecture of churches, borrowed from the book of Mamelba. Kinumdum <laughs> And this is in Bolhoon. No? This is in Daan, Bantayan. Okay. Now, El Cuadro of Paints and Images. Images create a myriad of narratives. They are worth a thousand words. And in symbol of the religious painting, squadro in Spanish, in church ceiling, is a caciquism in visuals. 
Biblical narratives are the usual themes in ceiling painting, depicting the life and ministry of Jesus Christ as the very core of all art artistic forms. Ceiling paintings hover the faithful that touch their senses in leading them to the encounter of the divine. Let me borrow the words of the Constitution of the Sacred Liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium. Holy Mother Church has therefore always been the friend of the fine arts and has ever sought their noble help with the special aim that all things set apart for use in divine worship should be truly worthy, becoming, and beautiful signs and symbols of the supernatural world. Now, even up to now, no, the church is the primary patron of the arts. No? Mo ni hinagiban sa simbahan ang iyahang work of arts. No? Di ka... Kung musod gag simbahan, walay work of arts, dili na katuliko. <laughs> Lain ng denomination, no? Because we always have the iconographic programs as part of the nourishment of our faith and even part of our faith, no? Itself. This is a beautiful pain, uh, ceiling painting in Sibunga, Pumbalikon. This is a new ceiling painting in Bantayan. This is an uh, old ceiling painting in Bolhoon. This is also an old ceiling painting painting in Argao. Okay. Porta Mayor of Wood and Doors. Church doors serve as transitions in two realms. The mundane, the outside, and the divine, in the inside. The opening of these doors stands for the entrance to the heavenly in contrast to the earthly outside of it. Door panels are laden with meanings. Heavenly realities such as angels, cherubim, and the like adorn church doors as porta celli or gate of heaven. Church doors, porta in Spanish, have two parts. The porta mayor or the big door when opened will draw the carosas in the church. No? Ang dako, no? kaning bugat kayo, no? While the porta minor or the postigo or the small door or postern is for the faithful to pass through. This is in Malabuyok at the left, Sibunga at the right, and then this is the cathedral. Okay. Now, Estaciones de la Cruz of Reliefs and Stations. The Paschal mystery of Jesus Christ, his passion, death, and resurrection is the central theme of the stations. These portray the saving action of Jesus Christ to humankind through his obedience, even up to his death on the cross. Different artistic interpretations add intensity to the depiction of the suffering of the, of the Christ that invite the faithful to reflect upon saving mysteries. No? Una, careful yun mo, inig istasyon ninyo kay Natoy Biata, nanibuong siya, nga naman yung ginoo nagkabaskog man, imbis magkaluya. So si Manhima, nabaliday, nagsugod siya sa katursi. Padungad to sa Pirmero. Ano man yung, ano man yung ginoo, nagkabaskog man, no? May buong in town siya, imbis maluya, nagkaligon. Kunya, kung sa puton gani mo, alam, alam mo ka, goal na, kaya hastagod ang ginoo, gisapot mo sa ito ang ginoo, no? O sa diyas mga istasyon, giingon, ang ginoo, gihubuan sa iyang sapot. <laughs> diba? <laughs> Imbis gihubuan siyang sapot, gihubuan siyang sapot. No, na, has nang gino, gisapot. No, okay ra, you have the excuse nga saputon mo. Okay. Now this is, uh, oh, sorry, this, uh, the, the left is the stations in Sibunga that's inside. The very unique one is the stations found in Argao. It's uh, at the Plaza Minor. Nga, um, nani siya'y upat ka um, kapilya posas before o niya ang gagmay, ang mugbo ng mga koral na adid to ang mga stations, no? Na heartache mini ni Melba kay <laughs> during the restorations na ay tayo mga unwarranted ng mga nahitabo. But still, we managed to have them still today, no? Unya, symbolic ang maong stations, no? Dili siya figurative. That's on the right side, no? Okay. Now, uh, the basilica at the left, pardo is in the right. No, lain lain silag design, lain lain silag work of arts. But na uban colorful kayo, technicolor. <laughs> Ay salamat conclusion nagyod. Wala ko puro na introduction. 
to conclude, the um, before that, let me um, borrow the words of opera artist, the circular letter of the care of the church historical and artistic heritage congregation. In commissioning artists and choosing works of art that are to become part of a church, the highest artistic standard is to be set in order that art may aid faith and devotion and be true to the reality it is to symbolize and the purpose it is to serve. To conclude, the history of the Philippines under the Spanish rule may seem to be a complicated story that combines memory of both glory and infamy. And this makes the basis of our influences. There are those influences that steer ambivalence and wanted just to shelve them off in a vacuum of forgetfulness. However, there are those influences that constitute the very fabric of our being, of who we truly are due to our pasts. Influences that caused us to raise our pride due to it. And this what makes us identified as Filipinos that offer us a sense of identity and a sense of pride. Pamanang Espanyol, the Hispanic influences in the ecclesiogenesis of the church cultural heritage of Cebu has given us the way to appreciate more those influences that offer us a sense of pride. Tracing back from the gift of the faith as the ecclesiogenesis, the Spaniards brought to us became the very beacon that guides the way of the birthing and the beginning of a church that established herself as the very fabric of who we are as Filipinos, gifting us with the beauty of the sacred arts, embodied in every aspect of the church as a building that moves our soul to lift up to heaven to encounter the divine beauty, the divine artisan. Let me end with this so words. Built environment has the capacity to affect the human person deeply, the way he acts, the way he feels, and the way he is. Church building affects not only how we worship, but also what we believe. Ultimately, what we believe affects how we live our lives. With that, dagan salamat. Salamat po paminaw sa introduction. <laughs> Daghang salamat, Father Brigoli, for sharing to us the different, no? Shogun, the different important cultural built properties here in Cebu, especially the built heritage. And one thing that I realized, wow, grabi kadato sa Cebu, no? <laughs> so, thank you so much again for sharing to us the Pamanang Espanol Hispanic influences in the church cultural heritage of Cebu. And now at this part of our program, we'd like to welcome one of our speakers who is joining us virtually. His topic is Through Education and Care for the Sick, the Daughters of Charity in 19th Century Visayas. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Aaron James Veloso from the National Commission for Culture and Arts. A round of applause, please. Sir Aaron, can you please can you hear me? Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I can hear you. Am I uh, loud and clear? Yes, sir. You are loud and clear. Before um, okay. we pin your um, slides for the share screen, can you please say hi? Turn on your camera. Hi. Uh, okay. Uh, hindi yes. pa po namin nakita. A moment lang po. Ayun. Sir, hi, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And good afternoon sa Tanan. Uh, to our friends from the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, led by Deputy Executive Director Alvin Alcid, uh, to our uh, to the fathers from the University of San Jose de Coletos, led by Father Tony Limchaiko, the Vice President for Administration, uh, our friends from the Spanish Embassy, at ang pinalanggang igsoon si Father Brian Brigoli, the head of the uh, Cebu Archdiocese and Commission for the Cultural Heritage of the Church, uh, Architect Mel Bahava, our uh, our keynote speaker for this afternoon, uh, mga paisanos, og amigos, uh, buenas tardes a todos. First, I'd like to thank the NHCP, the USJR, and the Embassy of Spain for inviting me to speak here in the Amistad Duradera Lecture Series. 
I am glad to see that the part two focuses on the Spanish legacy on spirituality here in the Visayas. Uh, this afternoon, uh, I will be speaking on a very a topic that is very close to my heart on the <clears throat> education apostolate of our sisters, the daughters of charity in the Visayas. Uh, so I'm not, I know all of you are familiar with the Coler de la Inmaculada Concepcion in Gorordo Avenue. So this is basically a history of, of CIC and how uh, the establishment of CIC uh, spread uh, uh, the education apostolate to various parts of the Visayas. No? So sorry, guys, si Father Brian, ganina na siya. Summary ako, wala ko nakaanda mag-summary, but I promise you, I'll try to finish on time. So now uh, I'll start with a short uh, quote from Father Jack Schumacher, a Jesuit historian and one of my idols uh, growing up. No, he, he was the one who got me interested in church history. He said in, in his book, Readings in Philippine Church History, that one aspect of the history of the Philippine church, which has been bad, badly neglected, is the role of religious women. So... What I want to do today, this afternoon, no, is to compensate that neglect that Father Schumacher mentioned by looking into to the contribution of our sisters, the Daughters of Charity, in shaping the cultural and educational landscape of the Visayas in the late 19th century and beyond. Now, I have to apologize at the onset. Now, if you would look at your program, uh, I promise to look at... Uh, the education and healthcare apostolate of the sisters, not only in Cebu, but also in Panay. But after I completed uh, the lecture, the paper that I am presenting this afternoon, I have come to the realization that I would need at least two hours to finish my my lecture. No? So I don't want to hold you hostage for two hours. So I hope you will indulge me if I would instead focus and sharpen my analysis on the sisters' legacy in educating women in Cebu while also tangentially touching on their contributions uh, on the healthcare apostolate. Now, let me start by talking uh, about the education system before 1862. That was the year that the sisters, the Vincentians and the Daughters of Charity arrived in the Philippines. Uh, a study conducted by Fox and Mercader uh, notes that on the 19th century, that the 19th century education in Cebu, uh, there, uh, one of the facts that can be gleamed across various sources was that there was already some sort of primary education or parang elementary education that was widely present in Cebu and in other parts of the Philippines, largely operated by the clergy. Now, for example, if you look at uh, what the Augustinian priest, Father Eladio Zamora, wrote, uh, just for uh, background, no, Father Zamora was an Augustinian priest, an OSA priest, and he was assigned in various parishes in Cebu and other parts of the Visayas for 23 years. And in 1899, in his book, he wrote that it was a usual practice in parishes conducted by the religious orders for the parish priest to construct in each barrio two schoolhouses of light but adequate materials, one for boys, and one for girls. No? So as you see, even before there was a public education system that was uh, mandated by law, uh, our missionaries, the friar orders, were already doing something similar by constructing schoolhouses for boys and for girls. Now the curriculum in these uh, friar-operated schools usually consisted of teaching Christian doctrine, catechism, and the three R's, the basic three R's, which are uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Now, for some girls, they also taught uh, sewing and other domestic arts not to prepare them possibly for, for, uh, for a life as a wife. No? Now, there are also free schools. Uh, these were all free schools, sorry, and most of them operated with little to no subsidy from the government, no, most of them are really operated by the clergy. Now, in some places, uh, the government would maybe would maybe pay for the salary of of a teacher or the schoolmaster, but basically the entire uh, enterprise was directly supervised and operated by the parish priest. 
Now, this is important because many contemporary writers, as contemporary meaning from the 19th century, assert that the education in the Philippines, again with a particular emphasis on Cebu, was in fact better than many European or Asian counterparts. No? Consider that in the early 1800s, in many parts of England or India or France, there were still a lot of people, especially in the rural areas, who do not uh, know how to read and to write. For example, again, referring back to the same study by Fox and Mercader, uh, he cited some references from uh, 19th century writers, among them the author Jean Mala, who wrote in his book Le Philippine. Uh, he mentioned that the three R's were more widely taught in the Philippines than in most of the country districts of Europe. Another is uh, a writing by the Augustinian priest Hilarion Diaz, who was superior, provincial superior of the Augustinians in the Philippines and later on became Archbishop of Manila in 1827. Uh, Father uh, Archbishop Diaz mentioned that there are many villages, such as in Argao and Delaguet and Boloon in Cebu, and several in the provinces of Iloilo, where not a single boy or girl can be found who cannot read or write. No? So imagine, in the 19th century, in the early 19th century, this Augustinian missionary was already talking about a high literacy rate about people from Argao, from Dalaget, from Boloon, and from Iloilo. Now, nevertheless, even if we hear this, these uh, observations about uh, the effects no, or the influence of basic education in, in the Philippines, the system still had many problems, among which are the low attendance rate of students, uh, the differing curricula implemented across various schools, various towns, the difficulty in reaching people in the villages, meaning those outside the poblacions, and the inadequate academic preparation for teachers. For example, during the course of the parochial visitation of Monsignor Santos Gomez Marañon, who was Bishop of Cebu from 1829 to 1847, he noted that in several towns, or he used varios, no? varios ang term na ginamit niya. In several towns, only a few boys and girls attend school. Our pastors, therefore, and he's mentioning what the parish priest should do, must bend every effort that all go daily to school and that the men and women teachers carry out completely uh, their work of instructing this, these children in reading, writing, and Christian doctrine. We are aware that the children of the distant barrios cannot be present at the Poblacion school, but if the pastor is zealous and sincerely desires the good of all his parishioners as he should be, he will see to it that schools are established in those parios, and the teachers are paid, and that the children are required to come. Now, this is the situation in Cebu, no? but in Manila, there's a, a little difference, no? especially in Intramuros, uh, bearing in mind, of course, that Manila was the capital of the Spanish administration of the Philippines. Uh, if you look at the education for girls, no? for women in Manila, while the curriculum is the same, there's a small difference in terms of the institutions present. So, for example, uh, there were boarding schools in Intramuros, no? not unlike those in Spain and other parts of Europe. Now, these boarding schools can be classified into two categories. Categories. First, the colegios or the standalone uh, boarding schools. Uh, and the second one would be the ones uh, operated or annexed to a biaterio no, or a beguinage, many of which were officially uh, established as uh, casas de recogimiento or uh, houses of learning. Of the first category, the colegios, uh, there were two in the early 19th century. First is the Coleo de Santa Potenciana, founded in 1591 as a residence and school for orphan girls of Spanish descent, and the second one being the Real Coleo de Santa Isabel, still existing today, no? which was founded in 1632 by the Cofradia de Santa Misericordia. Now, among the Beaterios, there were a number uh, established in the 17th and 18th century, many of which uh, have descendant educational institutions in Manila, which are still existing. 
For example, the Beatriz de Santa Catalina established by uh, Mother Francisca del Espiritu Santo is the forerunner of today's Santa Catalina College in Sampaloc, Manila. That, that is why for those who are from Carcar, there's a school there, the St. Catherine School is operated by the same congregation. <clears throat> you also have the Beatriz de la Compañía de Jesus uh, established by Mother Ignacia del Espiritu Santo in 1684 which is the forerunner of today St. Mary's College in Quezon City, which is operated by the Religious of the Virgin Mary. The same with uh, the Beatere de San Sebastian, founded by Mothers Junicia and Cecilia Talangpas, uh, founded in 1719, from where today St. Rita College in Quiapo originates. Another is the Beatere de Santa Rita, founded in 1740 by Fray Felix de Trillo, an Augustinian uh, friar, in Pasig, and an ancestor of today's uh, Coleo del Buen Consejo in the same city. And finally, the Beatera de Santa Rosa, founded by a Dominican tertiary Madre Paula de la Santísima Trinidad uh, in uh, 1750, which today is now known as the Coleo de Santa Rosa, which is present in both Intramuros and in Makati. Now, One of the things that you will notice is that I listed down through all of these uh, secondary schools and the schools of uh, higher learning for women, but none of them were in Cebu. In fact, the only institution of higher learning uh, present in Cebu, be it for men or for women, was only, there was only one, the Colleria de San Ildefonso, founded in 1595 by the Jesuits. Uh, in 1768, after the suppression of Charles III, after Charles III suppressed the Society of Jesus in all Spanish territories, the Coleo was forced to close. And in 1779, the Bishop of Cebu converted the property of San Ildefonso into the Seminary de San Carlos, which only functioned as such in 1825, no? And in fact, uh, while uh, it is being considered you know, as a predecessor of, of the University of San Carlos, it only functioned as a colegio or a secondary school in 1867 when the Vincentians uh, began to operate the seminary. Now, in the first half of the 19th century, organized systems of modern public education began to be introduced in Europe, beginning in France, 1833 and later on in Spain in 1857. The Philippines followed suit, no, being a Spanish territory. And on December 20, 1863, a royal decree was issued by Queen Isabel II implementing a plan for primary instruction in the Philippines. A plan uh, for instruction primaria de Filipinas. So this plan was uh, devised not only for Spanish Uh, Spanish children living in the Philippines, but also for natives, for Filipinos. No? Its provision represented a radical educational reform, hoping to improve uh, the quality of education on the islands in accordance with the demands of the time, no? to make it at par with those in, uh, in the continent, in the European continent. Now, contrary to popular belief, this decree, the 1863 decree, did not create eight free elementary schools because, as I mentioned earlier, the friars already established several, in most towns, an elementary school for women and for men, for boys and girls, rather. But what this decree did was to nationalize the entire system and place the education system under government control. No? So it was no longer just the domain of the clergy, but it became the primary responsibility of the Philippine, of the Spanish administration in the Philippines. Among the most important characteristics of this plan that I was mentioning is first, no, it, it required that there be two schools in every towns, regardless of the number of inhabitants, one for boys and another for girls. No? And in some cases, in bigger towns, it also required the setting up of uh, schools in different barrios and villages. It also made primary education of children of both sexes compulsory from age 7 to 12. No? So they have to be in school when they're 7 to 
It also mandated that the same ped pedagogical principles and regulations as those used in Europe, meaning the same teaching techniques and standards, be implemented in the Philippines. It also made mandatory the use of Spanish as medium of instruction in all schools. At the same time, because the parish priests no longer operated the schools on their own, the office of the inspector, or what we are more familiar in today's uh, terminology, is the principal, was delegated to the parish priest of the town ex officio. So he was the principal of the school. And then the same decree guaranteed that all teachers will receive salary, not depending on the goodwill of the parish priest or of the uh, local governor Silio, and mandated that the teachers and their families be given accommodation in the schools where they are uh, teaching. It also prohibited corporal punishment, except for certain uh, practices that were considered acceptable. And most importantly, the decree made permanent the regulation that public education should be given free of charge and that school materials should be provided. So now, if you can see a lot of the same uh, principles continue to govern our uh, basic education system nowadays. Now, So it was really that 1863 decree that kind of shaped how uh, our public education system uh, looked like for the past uh, 160 years now in broad strokes. Now, the same decree established a Comisión de Instrucción Pública which is the forerunner of today's Department of Education. And some years later, in 1871, it created a Junta Superior de Instrucción Pública, presided by the Governor General. So this Junta Superior is like the, uh, the PRC. You know, it administers the exam for people, for graduates, who want to uh, receive a certificate to become a maestro or a maestra. Now, this, of course, professionalized the teaching profession in the Philippines, and which is very important considering that by the end of the Spanish administration of the archipelago in 1898, there were about 2,167 primary schools in the country with about 200,000 graduates between 1863 and 1900s. So now at this point, maybe you're asking where do the Daughters of Charity come in in the picture? They're actually now the next part of, of the discussion. No? So just to give you a brief background, the Daughters of Charity of St. Vincent de Paul, or uh, in Spanish, known as the Yes de la Caridad, was founded in Paris by St. Vincent de Paul and St. Louis de Maria in 1633, November 29, 1633. Now, it was an offshoot of the co Confraternities of Charity or what we know, what we continue to know now as the Ladies of Charity, who were composed back then of influential women in the court of the French king. No? And it was a response to do charity work in a more organized manner, uh, considering the needs of the poor in Paris and in France in the uh, 17th century France. Now, the inspiration to organize charitable works further led St. Vincent and St. Louis to establish this congregation, the Daughters of Charity, as a company of non-cloistered women. So, dili na sila pareho sa mga Carmelites, for example, ng mga mongha, no? Because in those days, all nuns were cloistered pareho sa mga Carmelites. So, instead, what Vincent and Louis wanted was a group of women who would dedicate their lives to serving God in the sick and the poor. Now, more than a century after it was founded in France, 1790, the Doctors of Charity arrived in Spain where they administered orphanages, uh, took, uh, took care of the sick in the hospitals, and provided for the education of children in schools. In 1836, uh, after the Civil War, uh, the whole institute, together with all religious congregations, were abolished until 1851, when it was re-established, one of the first ones to be re-established, together with the congregation of the mission. But after a few months, when they were re-established in uh, Spain, the Ayuntamiento de Manila, the like the city government of Manila, requested Queen Isabella to send 10 sisters 
for the primary intention of administering the hospitals in the city of Manila and the school for girls. Now, with the support of the then Governor General Antonio de Urbistondo, Queen Isabel uh, II issued a decree on 19 October 1852, which mandated the transfer of all hospitals in the Philippines belonging to the Brothers of St. John of God to the Daughters of Charity, and then uh, assigning the sisters to take care of uh, the schools attached to the Beaterios of Uh, of La Compañía de Jesús and San Sebastián and the Colegios of uh, Santa Potenciana and Santa Isabel. Now, in the same decree, the Vincentians were sent to the Philippines and asked them to take care of all the seminarios conciliares in the country, including San Carlos Seminary in Cebu. Now, given the very controversial way in which uh, the decree was written, uh, as you can see, a lot of Uh, administrators were suddenly dispossessed of their of their properties. No, uh, it took some time. No, there were some obstacles for the coming of the sisters. But however, with the assistance of General Echague, who would later on become Governor General of the Philippines, fifteen sisters led by the superior Sortiburcia Ayan arrived in Manila together with four Vincentians on July twenty two, eighteen sixty two. Now. Immediately after their arrival, ten sisters uh, took uh, took over the Hospital Militar de Manila as requested by General Echague, while five sisters continued to stay in Santa Isabel while awaiting for the opening of the Escuela Municipal para Niñas, a work which would open the the school would open two years later in 1864. Now the same school was designated as the first normal school for women or the first school for teachers, para maestra, by the Spanish uh, civil government in 1871. So it bears noting that between 1864 and the 1900s, end of the Spanish colonial period, the Escuela Municipal was under the administrations of the sisters, the daughters of charity, and 500 to 600 of their graduates uh, received the title maestra, after passing the examination administered by the Unta Superior. Now, these maestras would then practice the profession in many parts of the Philippines, including in Cebu, as I would later touch on. Now, the Twin Ministry of Education and Care for the Sick and the Poor would eventually be the template uh, of the apostolic field of the Daughters of Charity in the Philippines. And uh, arguably, it is their biggest contribution in Philippine culture and society. Now, in the field of education, they were known for bringing the French method of teaching, espoused by one of the first sisters to arrive in the Philippines, Sor Maria Ibarra, a Spanish daughter of charity who was trained in this method in Paris. The French method became the bedrock of the educational ethos of the sisters in the schools where they would eventually uh, establish or administer during the Spanish colonial period including the, as I mentioned earlier, and as required by the Queen, Santa Isabel, uh, Coleo de Santa Rosa, uh, the schools in Nueva Cáceres, uh, including the Escuela Normal Coleo de Santa Isabel in Naga in 1868, uh, the Coleo de la Inmaculada Concepción de la Concordia in Santa Ana, Manila, which was opened in 1870, The Coleo de San Jose in Haro Iloilo, which began in 1872. The Coleo de la Milagrosa in Calbayog, uh, Calbayog Samar, which was opened in 1885. And the Asilo Coleo de San Vicente de Paul in Paco, Manila, which was opened in the same year. Meanwhile, their works also on the care of the sick multiplied and entrusted to their care were various hospitals and hospices, including Hospice de San Jose, the Hospital de la Marina in Cavite, and the Hospital de San Juan de Dios in Camulot. Now, if you will notice, none of these institutions actually speak of something in Cebu. No? In fact, except for Coleo de la Milagrosa in Calbayog and maybe Coleo de San Jose in Iloilo, all of the works of the Daughters of Charity were concentrated in Luzon. Now, where does Cebu fit its picture? Now, the answer lay uh, in Coleo de la Inmaculada Concepcion in Cebu. No? So many of us know this colegio as 
uh, Inmaculada or CIC, no? I don't know if some of you are Inmaculadistas, founded in 1880, the college claims to be the first Catholic school for girls in Cebu and is currently administered by the Daughters of Charity with campuses in uh, Gorordo Avenue and in Mandawin. Now, it will be important for the purposes of this lecture to trace the lineage of this institution and to see how it contributed to the development of education of girls and the intellectual tradition in Cebu and to a wider scale in the Visayas. Now, unlike many other educational institutions, the roots of Inmaculada can be traced to a hospital founded in 1864. The hospital was uh, established by Monsignor Romualdo Jimeno, who was then Bishop of Cebu, uh, from, in a house rented from Don Gabriel with the intention of serving people with leprosy. This house was called Casa de la Caridad uh, and was opened and closed several times until one Vincentian priest named Father Fernando de la Canal, who was then assigned as spiritual director of San Carlos Seminary, entrusted its operation to a senora named Baldomera. However, Baldomera was not very zealous and she would quickly relinquish the assignment and in her stead, Father de la Canal would uh, assign three virtuous Cebuanas who volunteered for the mission. They were Apolonia Lasala y Rosales, born in 1845 uh, in Sogod, Cebu, Rafaela Echeverria, born in 1850, and Julia Aveliana e. Extevere, born in 1853 in San Nicolas, Cebu. So they were uh, spiritual directees of uh, Father de la Canal. No? You can see them. They were they are the ones highlighted in the photo. Uh, they were spiritual directees of Father de la Canal, and they began to serve in the Casa de la Caridad as nurses on October 24, 1877. Now, Father de la Canal was the spirit and force behind the new apostolate and guided the three, Apolonia, Rafaela, and Julia, in both the spiritual and practical aspect of, of the work in a hospital. However, after less than a year of service, both the women, the three women, and Father de la Canal was convinced that their vocation was to serve in the ministry of the sick in the Casa de la Caridad. So with the consent of the Bishop of Cebu, Bishop uh, Benito Romero de Madridejos, a Franciscan, they began to wear the habit and were organized into a religious institute called the Congregación de las Hermanitas de la Madre de Dios, which was established on September 8, 1878. Now, Sora Polonia, the one in the middle, the middle of the three, <clears throat> was elected as the first superior of the small community whose rules were based on the common rules or the constitutions of the Daughters of Charity. And like the DC sisters, had for their apostolate the care of the sick and the poor. Now, vocation for the, to the hermanitas of the congregation flourished with applicants coming from different parts of the Visayas and even as far away as uh, Camarines Sur and Manila. Bishop Madridejos then proposed the opening of a colegio for girls under the ad administration of the Hermanitas to complement the one for the boys already operated by the Vincentians in the Seminario Conciliar de San Carlos. To do this, no, they looked for professional teachers in Manila. And two alumni from the Daughters of Charities Escuela Municipal de Niñas, the one I mentioned earlier, arrived in February 1880. They were uh, Ilaria Salinas Ilobrio, born in 1852 in Ermita, Manila, and Cirila Miranda y Alberto, born in 1854, 1854 in Intramuros. Now, they were not only to be teachers, apparently, because by May 15, they received the habit of the hermanitas. And 15 days later, on May 30, they began to serve as directress and assistant directress respectively, of the Coleo de la Inmaculada Concepcion, which was inaugurated in the same day. Now, the roots of the school was uh, sunk deep in a house rented from a person named Don Antonio Roa uh, in, in a house in front of the seminario, the old seminario, which is near Fort San Pedro now, uh, 
uh, and adjacent to the Casa de la Caridad along Martire Street. The building had three classrooms, two on the second floor and one on the third floor for the Escuela Municipal. Initially, the student population consisted of 30 resident students, 30 internas, six half boarders, and 30 day students. No? So, yung resident students, they were the internas, they lived with the nuns in the school. The half boarders are those which eat lunch there, and the day students are those who only go there for classes and go home for lunch. Now, these half-boarders and the day students were in reality students of the Escuela Municipal, not the government-funded free school, which was later called on called as the Escuela Católica de San Vicente de Paul, which operated in the same building administered by the same sisters. Now, like the Manila schools for women steeped in the French method, the Inmaculada, or what we know now as CIC, taught the three R's, a little geography and history, religion, and home economics. The famed Cebuano musician Don Juan Borromeo taught the music courses in the school. Like in all public schools, as mandated in the 1863 decree, Spanish was the medium of instruction in the Inmaculada. Now, over time, the providential mustard seed that was Inmaculada grew into a big fertile tree absorbing into it the Casa de la Caridad, the hospital, which for the last time closed in 1885 and whose facilities were used for the colegio. Ten years later, in 1880, uh, a new wing on the Lapu-Lapu Street side of the block was built. So, bali tatlo na yung building no time na yon. One in Lapu-Lapu, one in Martires, and one in what is now known as MJ Cuenco. So between 1880 and 1896, records show that Inmaculada had an average of 340 female students annually, mostly from towns outside Cebu. The course offering of Inmaculada also expanded over time, such that by the end of the Spanish occupation of the Philippines, Inmaculada was already offering the following courses. So, of course, you have like the basic uh, education courses. You have the Clase Preparatoria, uh, you have the Clase Media, the Clase Superior, and the Clase Normal, which is the program for those who want to become maestras or teachers. Then you have the technical courses, the Tachigrafia, or what is now known as Tenography, and Mechanografia, Typing, no? so Typewriter. Uh, so, these are short vocational technical courses and special courses on piano and singing, piano y canto, pintura or painting, flores y frutas, and bordado y labores, so embroidery. So now at this point, it would not be sufficient to just talk about the legacy of building the school, no? because of course it goes beyond that. But it would be important to look at what were the legacies moving forward of, of the Daughters of Charity and uh, CIC in terms of their contribution to the Cebuano intellectual and religious culture? Now, one of the things that is often highlighted, uh, as mentioned several times in the books and publications of uh, the deceased author, Dr. Luciano Sanchago, was that the Hermanitas, de la, the Hermanitas de la Madre de Dios, founded by Father de la Canal, is actually the first canonically established local congregation in the Philippines. What does this mean? It means that except for the Monasterio de Santa Clara, which was, uh, which was close to Filipinos and were exclusive for Spanish nuns, it was the Hermanitas were the first one to be established as sisters. All the rest were actually just biatas, no? people, women in particular, uh, who do not take vows but live like sisters. It's because they are not allowed by the Spanish government and by the archbishop. No? So the Hermanitas in Cebu were the first one to be canonically established as a religious congregation. And in fact, in 1888, the then Bishop of Cebu, Bishop Martin Garcia y Alcocer, gave 
uh, approval for the constitutions of the sisters. Now, uh, it's important to put a postscript to the story now because you might be wondering, where are the Hermanitas now? Uh, we haven't, I haven't heard of a congregation named Hermanitas in the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, they're no longer existing primarily because they joined the Daughters of Charity. In the early 1890s, Father de la Canal, uh, at that point, no, he was very old and he knew that he would die uh, in the near future. So he thought of discussing with his superiors the possibility of combining the Hermanitas and the Daughters of Charity who were already in the Philippines, considering that they share the same charism and the same rule. In 1894, Father Eladio Arnaiz, a Vincentian priest, was sent to conduct a visitation of Coleo de la Inmaculada Concepcion on behalf of the Superior General of the Vincentians. And seeing positive fruits, no, he recommended the incorporation of these Cebuano sisters to the Daughters of Charity. And so on 28 January 1895, Father Manuel Oriols and uh, Sister Tiburcia Ayans, sorry, Sister Tiburcia Ayans formally incorporated the 18 living hermanitas into the Daughters of Charity. So you will see uh, all the names which are listed in white are the living ones. Those in blue were those who died before 1895. So I think there are about six of them. So the, the 18 were uh, integrated into the Daughters of Charity and a Spanish sister, Sor Celestina Escalona, uh, was brought in to be their superior. And so henceforth, until now, uh, it's the Daughters of Charity who are running Coler de la Inmaculada Concepcion. Now, the second and uh, perhaps one of the bigger legacies of the Daughters of Charity is their contribution, their efforts in starting secondary education of girls in Cebu. No? But I guess at this point, it's important to clarify, to uh, refine what uh, Inmaculada's claim is. No? Obviously, they're not the first uh, Catholic school for girls in Cebu because there were smaller parochial schools uh, that were present before 1880. But they were the first colegio for girls in Cebu. They were the first secondary school for, uh, for girls in Cebu. And the founding of uh, the Coleo de la Inmaculada Concepcion, as well as the Escuela de San Vicente de Paul, the free school, helped provide opportunities for Cebuano girls to receive secondary education, especially because before CIC was established, the only option for girls back then was to study either in Manila, where most of the Beaterios and Colegios are, or in the Escuela Normal in Naga in Camarines Sur. Now, after the incorporation of the Hermanitas into the Daughters of Charity, there were several activities to upgrade uh, Immaculada. This include uh, updating and upgrading facilities and systems of the school. As mentioned earlier, a new wing. So you see here, I don't know if my cursor is showing. On the, the left wing was the original one facing Solidaridad Street. That was the original Casa de, Casa de la Caridad, followed by the building of this side, uh, which is now MJ in, in what is now MJ Cuenco Street, uh, where the Inaculada was formally established in 1880. And in 1895, a new wing was built on this side, on the left side, uh, facing Lapu Lapu Street. Now, this, uh, this upgrading of facilities allowed uh, Immaculada to increase the number of its internas or borders from 80 to 100. Uh, it was part of the building, the rebuilding efforts uh, in the late uh, 1800s and early 1900s uh, due to the inheritance received by one of the original hermanitas, Sor Damiana Veloso, and which connected the structures facing Martire Street and Solidaridad Street, and later on uh, completed the quadrangle by building another wing uh, facing Ordaneta Street in 1915. 
Now, unfortunately, this whole complex is no longer existing, as you know very well, because both the Immaculada and the Seminary de San Carlos were destroyed during World War II. And now, you know that the CIC is present in Gorordo Avenue, where their uh, complex now is. Now, in terms of curriculum, Immaculada was the first one to offer, the first Catholic school, rather, to offer the basic education curricula in English starting in 1911. Eventually, its music department was also renowned, no? Uh, and its music department was formally established uh, in 1915. Now, the Escuela de San Vicente de Paul, the municipal school, continued to uh, operate during the last years of the Spanish occupation, uh, but this had to end in 1898 because it no longer it can no longer be an escuela municipal because of the separation of church and state which the Americans imposed. <clears throat> and in fact, even during the, towards the last years of the Spanish occupation, the enrollment in Escuela de San Vicente de Paul uh, gradually shrunk uh, to around 60 to 80, primarily because more schools were established in the barrios and the students didn't have to come all the way to to uh, to CIC, the old CIC, to study. Nevertheless, uh, the Daughters of Charity continued to maintain the Escuela Municipal until the end of the Spanish occupation, during which it continued, it, it was incorporated and continued as a free school, now directly of the Immaculada. And also, it's uh, good to point out now that Immaculada was the spark that allowed the Daughters of Charity to expand their education ministry in Cebu with the foundation or administration of various educational institutions in the island province. This includes the Asilo de San Jose, which was established in uh, 1890 in Cebu City. The Coleo del Niño Jesus, also in Cebu City, which was opened in 1908 and later on merged into the Immaculada. The Escuela de la Sagrada Familia in Bogo, uh, which was founded in 1936 and now known as the St. Louis de Mariac School. And uh, the Asilo de la Milagrosa, which was founded in 1936 and which had a school named the Miraculous Medal School from 1946 to 1983. And the San Martin de Porres, uh Academy in the Anbantayan, which was founded by Cardinal Rosales in 1968, and which was recently turned over to the Archdiocese of Cebu. And finally, the youngest of them all, the branch of the Immaculada in Mandawe, opened in the old the old villa of the sisters on their vacation house in Mandawe, which was opened in 1969. Now, another legacy that is worth noting is the contribution of the Daughters of Charity to uh, education, in particular to public education in the province. Uh, it must be stressed that the two colegios uh, in Spanish Cebu, namely the Coleo Seminary de San Carlos and the Coleo de la Inmaculada Concepcion, help develop the local education system by at least two ways. First, because graduates, it helped the education system because graduates of primary schools, meaning the schools established in the towns and the parishes, uh, had a place to go to for secondary education. That's the first. And second, these schools, both San Carlos and the Immaculada, served as a feeder. It provided uh, graduates uh, who were eventually allowed to take the teacher certificate examination starting in 1890. So in the case of Inmaculada, the Unta Superior de Instruccion Publica was satisfied with the quality of education that it permitted the graduates of CIC to take the examination for the Maestra certificate starting 1890. Now this is important because until 1893, technically there was no freestanding uh, normal school or school for te for teachers no? and the Daughters of Charity in Manila, in Naga, in Cebu had a virtual monopoly in forming women teachers. Uh, this can be validated in the list provided uh, by Fox and Mercader in 1961. There, among the 
few female teachers in uh, 19th century Cebu was Juan Magdalena Zozobrado, who was a primary school teacher in Dumanhug, Cebu, and who was listed as an alumna of Immaculada. It is also no surprise then that when the American colonial administration expanded the public education system in the form that we now know today, many of the teachers in the Visayas region were well-prepared graduates of the CIC. So it, in a way, the influence of CIC was not only in terms of Catholic education, but also informing teachers for the public school system, especially with the advent of secular education under the American colonial period. I, I was told I have seven minutes left, so I have to go through my slides very quickly. Another legacy of the Daughters of Charity was in the growth of piety in, in the province, in the Archdiocese of Cebu. Uh, for example, the Daughters of Charity have fostered a devotion to Our Lady of the Miraculous Medal, which is a devotion particular to our uh, to the Vincentian family. The sisters established, for example, the first unit of the Ies de, la, Ies de Maria, or the Children of Mary, in the CIC in 1905. Today, as many of you know, it remains one of the biggest uh, devotions in Cebu. And every November 27, throngs of people come to her shrine in Asilo to celebrate. The sisters also supported the growth of the Damas de la Caridad, many of whom were alumni of the Immaculada, and which eventually led to the foundation of the Asilo in 1936. Now, another often forgotten contribution of the sisters was the establishment of the Imprenta de San Jose or the St. Joseph Printing Press in 1890, which was built to uh, support financially the Asilo de San Jose in Cebu. At the time that it was established, it was the most modern printing press in Cebu. And in fact, it was only it was one of only two existing in the province, the other one being the press of uh, the newspaper Bulletin de Cebu. While most of the imprenta's work focused on religious topics, for example, novenas and pamphlets, it did sustain for almost 11 years the publication Ang Kabatuhora, or La Verdad. A fortnightly comes every 14 days. Excuse me. A fortnightly publication uh, which first appeared in 1902. It was edited by uh, Monsignor Pablo Singson, who would become the first Bishop of Calbayog, and Father Pedro Ulia, a Vincentian priest. While it is not the first periodical printed in Cebuano, the record is held by uh, Ang Suga of Vicente Soto, which was published a year earlier. Uh, Ang Kamatuoran remains to be an important record of the ways of adapting the local church had to take after the Philippine Revolution which include, for example, going into journalism and literature. Prior to Ang Kamatuoran, the only church publication was the Bulletin de la Diocesis de Cebu, a gazette of some sorts which was present from 1888 to 1892. Unfortunately, the printing press was destroyed during World War II and after the war, the sisters no longer established a physical printing press but rather contracted out the printing of the novenas, which until now they are printing to a third-party printer. Now, the novenas may seem dated, but uh, they are they remain to be good records of pious literature and music from the pre-war era. Now, in 2012, uh, just to recap everything, uh, in 2012, we celebrated the 150th anniversary of the arrival of the Congregation of the Mission, the Vincentians, the Daughters of Charity in the Philippines. More than 11 years since that milestone, one cannot help but remain overwhelmed with gratitude for the persistence and zeal of our earlier confreres and sisters, especially those who came from Spain. One of the former provincial visitors and director of sisters, Father Ramon Sanz, in fact, once wrote uh, to another confrere, as I have told you in my previous letters, the mission and the houses in the Philippines occupy a place of preference in my heart, and I am ready to do anything I can for its preservation and progress. With them, the new missionaries, I am sending you good and capable personnel for all the various ministries. You can see how generous and how zealous the Spanish conference were. 
Now, I would like to think that when the Daughters of Charity came to the Philippines, or for that matter, the Vincentians or uh, the Hermanitas when they uh, first began their work, it was not their primary intention to solidify their presence by building institutions or establishing huge complexes that will uh, influence generations of Cebuanos and Filipinos. Certainly, their desire to serve through education and care of the sick was fueled by a deeper conviction to imitate Christ and our founders, a, convic a conviction that comes from the Vincentian vocation, as their motto states, the charity of Christ crucified in Pelsa. Be that as it may, the fruits of their ministry in Cebu continue to redound to this present age, not only in the field of uh, religion and education, but also in social work, in literature, and in music. Like Father Schumacher, I can only hope that more studies will be made on the contribution of religious women, both those who began their apostolates in the Philippines during and after the Spanish colonial period, in order to liberate the stories of these women from anonymity, and to paint a fuller picture of their contributions towards the development of the Filipino Catholic society. And with that, muchisimas gracias, maraming salamat, naghang salamat, ug maayong hapon sa tanong. Thank you so much, Mr. Aaron James Arveloso. At this juncture, as promised, we will now have the open forum. May I invite to join us on stage, Reverend Father Brian Briguli. He will be joined still by the speakers from this morning. Can I ask Architect Hava to still join us on stage for the open forum? Because I know there are a lot of questions that one that was supposed to be raised earlier, but then we were short of time. So aside from Architect Hava, is Dr. Burinaga still around? Sir, please join us here on stage and online. Sir Aaron, please stay because our participants, both on-site and online, may still have some questions for you. <laughs> At this juncture, uh, each of our speakers are provided one, quest one microphone. And for the participants on-site who want to ask a question, there's a mic provided at the aisle. And for our online audience, please do not hesitate to drop your comments or questions below. So for our on-site audience, final reminder, please state your name, your institution, and then your question. Uh, hello, good, e uh, good evening. Naman. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Giovanni Piero Simalito Jr. I am from uh, Cebu Doctors University, part of the Faculty of the College of Arts and Sciences, teaching social sciences and international studies subjects. I just would like to, this is a question uh, to be thrown by Dr. Burinaga and also uh, Father, I forget the name, sorry. Brian. Brian. Brian no? So, uh, Dr. Uh, our doctor uh, Burinaga. Burinaga a while ago mentioned uh, the how how the symbolism of the mother and son no? from pre-colonial to the colonial era was uh, translated from the animism to Catholicism, and even until today, you have mentioned that these symbols are even used no in ordinary uh, let's say uh, places like for example in the dashboard of the cars no, that uh, our brothers and sisters have. But then, uh, Father mentioned a while ago that uh, arts can be a tool, for a theological tool for evangelization. Now, I want to understand if what we see right now is really an authentic uh, manifestation of the Christian faith because we all know that there are some people you know, that does not really understand well the so-called... Uh, teachings of the Catholic Church, no? And even uh, undermines the magisterium of the church, no? So for example, uh, we have seen, no, a resurgence of the so-called animism also of how they see the Santo Nino. So, na ay, nilihok ang Santo Nino, nisayaw. So even if the Catholic Church is uh, saying that it's not uh, an official miracle, then others would still uh, believe, no, this particular uh, phenomenon. So how do we see no, really, 
the so-called uh, uh, faith of, 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 of other Catholics, no? Because we all know that they, I'm not sure if they really know the theology behind the symbolism, no? the art that we see right now, no? as what Father said. So that is my question. So thank you. I think for my part, so since I'm not a theologian, so I can't really comment on the <laughs> kung asa ang official or orthodox, niya asa ang unorthodox. Ana. But uh, what's interesting is something uh, noted by Father Richard Arens, so SBD na siya, German priest, nga, one of those who were displaced from China, nga, mga priest scholars ni Bali ng Philippines na abot siya takloban, pero nakuampot siya sa graduate school in USC in the 1950s. So, matunga, he went to this uh, Mark Pilgrimage Shrine sa summer. Nga noted nga, the pilgrims, Mark na sila yung mga uh, actions nga I think for him as a European missionary was somehow mag animistic. Uh, so he was commenting how mag mag ilang magdakubosis ko no ang isa ka pilgrim mag padong sa dool sa altar. So for him that he found that strange. Pero I think for a lot of natives, kay they can't really tell uh, which is orthodox and which is unorthodox. Kay as mentioned, kada diba na continuities from the pre-colonial ng mga practices and beliefs. So even ang katong sa belief nga ang ancestor helped you with good health, well-being, good crops. Kaya in the 1950s, it was still noted by the anthropologists. Uh, again, this is a kuan na, marag animistic na, the belief that your ancestors helped you out with uh, healing and so on. But uh, nasagulan na nga, instead of going to Sulad or Saad, which was not actually heaven ang sa pre-colonial times. It was either underground or somewhere not really warm like in Ila Idea sa Heaven in the early 1600s upon the evangelization of the Jesuit. Kaya nareklamo sila, why would we go up there nga? Terting init naman na dito. Very warm dito sa taas. So, uh, again, another processing nila of the uh, doctrine of Christian doctrine, but um, in terms of how uh, to categorize it, so again, it might be up to the uh, clergymen or theologians, and I think Father Brian can <laughs> help me out. Uh, as presented, we know that the uh, manifestation of faith is actually in the tangible and visible things. That's why the church is always the patron of the arts and elevating the very dignity of art into a sacred art as the highest uh, form and manifestation of that art. However, when art is uh, being um, called to express faith, that is not the end of it because faith would always translated into devotions and that is where the authenticity comes in if faith and devotion would lead to conversion that would that is also one of the many considerations of the authenticity of the religiosity that is why every sort of a miracle the church uh, hierarchy would always come in for a close um, investigation in order to uh, somehow um, exercise the many faculties of the church that is for its teaching faculty to teach nothing but the truth and also to lead the souls for its salvation not uh, leading the souls astray or giving confusions to, uh, to people in, in, in such a way that um, it would rather create um, doubts in their minds and their hearts rather than leading towards the truth and therefore the church would always exercise this um, that's uh, being careful with its interpretation to manifestations in such a way finding authenticity uh, from it. But in a personal level, as long as the person, there is always that devotion and conversion, then the church would respect on that. No? What if more ni nakabuutan na ining tawhana nga bisan nagwa gideklarar sa simbahan nga official, um, so to speak, miracle, then that is personal conversion and the church would always welcome that on that level but in the level of the hierarchy there are still a lot of processes investigations before 
the church could finally proclaim that such a phenomena is indeed beyond reasonable uh, doubt that this is with the divine intervention and thus be called a miracle. But that is not with the level of our authority that has to proclaim it. It must be coming from, <laughs> from above. One follow-up, yes. Uh, towards Father, do you think that uh, the establishment of the Vatican II has something to do with this, considering that in the Second Vatican Council, we are to uh, uh, encourage no, the expression of liturgical practices in the context of one's culture? I think that's exactly the very product of the times, no? because the Arjunamento is always the product of the time, and that is something biblical. That is why um, evangelization comes from different facets. No? It's not only about theological per se, but it is also cultural. Uh, even it is also um, uh, in, in uh, inculturation, no? inculturation of that cultural uh, realities of the complicated fabric of humanity. Because before, the expression of the church was always Western. And outside of it, that is not a church, no? that is not what the church is teaching. But due to the Arjunamento, faith becomes culturated. And that means part of who we are, our way of life, could also be our way of saving ourselves. No? And that is why even Christianity as a whole culturalized the Roman power, including their structures, their festivities, their even deities. Because faith, after all, is a that comes from the very culture, it permeates within the culture, and it is culture itself that is salvific. And that is why the church is now very open to all these things. Thank you so much. Now let's move on to our second participant. Okay, um, so good afternoon, um, esteemed panelists. So um, I am Erjan A. Bisario. I am a um, part of Cebu Doctors University. I also teach, um, I'm part of the College of Arts and Sciences and I was once also uh, a teacher of University of San Jose Recoletos who thought um, history, so this is just a what if question addressed to Professor Borinaga. So I'm a fan of what if, I do believe that um, Cebu, I mean the Philippines, majority of the settlements in the Philippines during the pre-Hispanic times were mostly Islamic communities. Do you think that's one of the reason why the image or you know, the image of the Holy Child was able to last through the years? Is it because of the animistic practices or what if Cebu during that time was an Islamic community? Do you think it's one of the factors? Because as I have read through the different historical documents, primary sources, I do believe Manila, which was also Manila, during that time was an Islamic community. I think the Visayas Islands were so-called pirate, di ba? mga pirata, that's why the Tagalogs feared the Visaya, kay we were piratas. So that's according to my research. So for your concern. So, sa case of the Visayas, uh, they were well-known uh, raiders. Uh, so, kato sa Mindanao, and that's actually one of the reasons you know, why uh, the Visayans was uh, badly affected by the Moro, so-called Moro raids. Because uh, before we were Christianized, we were the ones doing the raiding in the uh, south. And we were disarmed, so it was their time to uh, makabawos ba, maka revenge. So, so. <laughs> But in terms of Islam, uh, it's not too well established that Islam had a wide nga influence in the uh, Cebu or the Visayas. So, uh, what's, kato, as you mentioned, Manila, it's fairly established nga connected you to sila sa Sultanate of Brunei. But I don't think that was the case with uh, Cebu. And uh, though ang sa kato, I, why would uh, Christianity become widespread here so kato uh, th th those are parts of the arguments na ko nga naanay ang structure was already there so ang technique na lang sa missionaries was to try to uh, establish an equivalence di ba nga marag Mary laon so it wasn't necessarily erad fully eradication lang as mentioned in the 
Latin American case. Okay. Uh, although ang argument is that uh, it, sa Latin America, it wasn't necessarily uh, uh, deliberate ang substitution. Pero we can see from those examples sa uh, old dictionaries in the lagda or rule book nga there was a bit of both, di ba? Nga, na ay, magamit sila old words like sulad for purgatory. So they also perhaps employed that strategy to try to win over the natives. Pero ang natives po, kay, they also appropriated, di ba? In the social movements, nga, uh, ganaan sila mubalik sa pre-colonial diwatas, kay they lost uh, confidence in their missionaries from protecting them from the Moro raids or from the uh, typhoons, di ba, kay punishment, mga kung ano epidemics, ang kuan. But for the Jesuits, they could also use that as a way of conversion. In fact, ang uh, sa 1590s nga epidemic attributed to Malaon, uh, a lot of people converted because ang style sa Jesuit, they asked for help from the uh, local herbalists. Di ba, mga mananambal, kabalo sila sa local cures, so, ang collaboration between the Jesuit and some local healers kay nakaproduce apparently sila og cure sa smallpox. And that was the attraction for a lot of people sa Bohol, sa Marleti. And in fact, ang mga Jesuit chroniclers mismo ang mo-admit nga mo ito'y style nila. Kay na ay epidemic. So just like how, di ba, kulit karon COVID, nakakita og vaccine. Ang ila, they found some apparent nga cure nga dagag cases nga matambal and that was the basis for a lot of people to flock to the Jesuits kay mabuhi kuno ang mataga ag baptism so that's why diba even today holy water ma associate gyapon na with uh, healing powers diba mo kanang mo ana ta nya mo so i think murag may pagka animistic pud na nga na retain pa nato but uh, again kana ang is that to be counted, like Father Brigoli said, nga, the church is now open and nga mga accommodations of older practices nga ni persist. Thank you. Okay, one follow-up question. Okay, thank you so much, um, Professor. So, this also addressed to Father Rigoli. So, do you think that the building of the different churches is the one of the reasons why Christianity or Roman Catholicism is um, kanang very very well established here in our country so what if walate churches like you know um no just like in europe but there are hundreds of churches there and yet no daghan kay mga tao murag um converting to atheism like that do you think it's one of the reasons the building of um churches um when it comes to the church as a structure or as an edifice for me it's really the uh the last thing if not the primary um, living testimony of a church that is uh, alive, no? Kaya kung wanto ta sa Europe, mas nindot magyud ilang mga simbahan nga do. No? Pero ang problem magnabay sud, no? Ato adere, bisan o guwapan na human, no? Sag na nga, nagka, o sa na, igislay. Pero igsud na yung mabuhi kayo, tungod kay, daghan kay mga bata mo. <laughs> Nimba sa bat sa bat sa misa no. Ibilin niyo mga bata kay di ni mangulikta ang ginikanan mo ipasudla. <laughs> and that means uh, even with the edifice as the structure, it is somehow symbiotic to how we live our life of faith, no? Um, the church is not being defined by its structure, but it is being defined as a people of God, no? Uh, people in journey with uh, its spiritual life, journey for salvation, and so many aspects of our humanity is actually uh, relevant to our being at church. We cannot say that my spirituality is only the realm of the church, my faith is only the realm of my church. Even your work, even your interests, even how, how you live your life in your domestic life no, is indeed an encompassing um, kind of how it is to be a church. No? There is no dichotomy of life, of faith, in the other aspects of our living. Thank you, Father. We have our third participant who would like to ask a question. Um, I'm Rabbi Mark Ika Macho from, I'm a fourth year marketing communication student of the University of San Jose Recoletos. And my question is, it's just a clarification. 
Um, in April 1521, Ferdinand Magellan arrived in Cebu where he met Raha Humabon and introduced his Christianity to the Philippines. Humabon and around 800 of his followers were baptized, marking the birth of Christianity in the archipelago. My first clarification is, was the image of Santo Nino really a gift, a gift intended for the Philippines? Was the conversion of Raha Humabon and his followers were, were sincere acceptance of Christianity? Or what I mean is that, have they really understood the catechesis of the, the baptism? Or was it driven by political motives to gain an advantage in trade and politics? And lastly, as a contemporary Filipino Catholics, how do we make meaning of this historic moment to an understanding of Philipp Philippines' Spanish Friendship Day that we commemorate today? So first is, I mean, was the image of Santo Nino really a gift intended to the Philippines? Second is that if, because there was a baptism, the second question is, was the conversion was really a sincere acceptance of Christianity or not? So it's more oh. of the context. Oh, so the first question about was it a gift? Uh, if you read the Pigafetta account, actually it was... Queen Juana who asked for the image. Okay. Kay, ba, magsigi siya balik sa, magpatagad sa Katsila. It, di ito. Kay, he, she wanted to get the image because she was, I think, apparently enamored with the uh, child Jesus. Mm -hmm. So, natong eventually Magellan ito, uh, gave it. Pero it wasn't a deliberate nga. It was planned na by Magellan to give the Santo Nino. It was... Okay. The agency of the queen. It was she who wanted the image. But about what happened about the conversion, was it because of na convinced sila by the Spanish is very difficult na, di ba? Because we don't have their accounts. It's, we can only conjecture. Although si, uh, the national artist, Dr. Resil Mujares, has argued that there is political motivation to si Humabon. But what's interesting, and this is uh, something argued by Dr. Ben Consejo, katong one of the quincentennial uh, talks, was that uh, that fact nga that Santo Nino was given to the Queen, it acknowledged ang equal, more or less equal status ni Humabon and her Queen. Kaya di ba in Europe, it's mainly the King ang uh, i acknowledge kay kanang kanalaging patriarchal or male centric dominated nga culture pero ang there is a Visayas at least that giving of the Santo Nino to the Queen is an indication nga ni respect sila sa katong equal status of the Queen and si Raha Humabon. With regards to the second question about the conversion, yes, no? yes, um, yes. actually uh, let me focus on the spirituality uh, dimension of conversion because every conversion is always an inter internal story. It is a internal relationship between the God who calls, who calls us and the person who responds to the calling. What happened in between, it's something that we cannot quantify but it is something there because the church would always plant the seed and it's up to us who would receive the faith to nurture the seed. No? However, there is a historical evidence to this. Because whenever uh, the first expedition, the, the, uh, that means the, the years after the first expedition, up to the second expedition, 40 years man kapin siguro, no? Pero pagbalik nila, buhi pagyapon ang pagtuo, naapagyapon ang simbahan, no? They thought nga ang gitanom nilang simbahan mamatay na. But there was still the the church uh, and the church is still living that means for me that conversion is indeed uh, genuine and it is really guided by the holy spirit whenever we come to the realization that there is really the holy spirit with it then something that we cannot quantify even in our rational and speculative levels something that we can consider beyond uh, that okay um follow up question lang sir and miss um after knowing this topic, it's really kind of, uh, ko in preserving our heritage and culture. So, moving on after 500 years or beyond the 500 years, um, there's two major kind of, issues in Cebu that is presented 
ay that kanang na challenge nato first is in the recently the archdiocese of cebu presented um it recently announces subuswak which is the plan is to divide the archdiocese into three dif into three different dioceses the mother church the diocese in north and then the diocese in south so and aside from the church there is also when after the 2022 elections rama presented um the Singapore life. So, regarding to the Singapore life, how do we? Uh, what might be the trade? What might be the trade-offs between modernization and heritage preservation? And also the same with the Subuswak. What would be the trade-offs between modernization and heritage preservation? So yeah. between modernization and heritage preservation. Oh, okay, there should, it, there is an apparent conflict, but there should, should never be. Because, because heritage looks into the past, but doesn't stay there. Heritage considers continuity. In fact, the word conservation uh, refers to the management of change. So it acknowledges the past, but also the possible changes that will happen and how management can help uh, protect the past as well as be open to ac the acceptance of the, of the future, the present and, and the future. There has to be continuity and heritage doesn't stop all that. Uh, while, w while we protect heritage, we can very well live with today and plan for tomorrow in a conversation with the past. You don't stop, but you converse, and then you, a, a conversation between two epochs, if, if you might put it that way. It can, it can happen. It is, it is not too easy because conservation of heritage is always attended by what we call father, no contestation. There is no, yes, there is no, sorry, there's no decision in heritage conservation that is made by a single person. Yes not by the expert, not by the priest, with due, with due uh, respect to Father, not by, by uh, gu guidelines from the West, but also with the community participation. It's really a multi-sectoral decision on how to conserve. So even the business sector must come in and the LGUs and the academe. So there's always a consensus and together we move forward while protecting heritage and agreeing on how to do it. So let's not look at the conflict as not uh, solvable, but uh, that can be done with consensus and mutual respect for each, for each view. And just a little bit of comment for previous uh, discussions. I don't think there was Muslim presence in Cebu because according to Pigafetta and some historical writers from uh, Spanish writers, they were served by Humabon on porcelain plates with beautifully cooked uh, pork, pork, oh, baboy good. So, one the ali to the Muslims. At the same time, also to add a little about the the role of backtrack lang ko gamay mamitya, katong role of culture without and the role it played in the acceptance of the Cebuanos to the new, to the new faith. I think God, God works with, with culture, with, gra with grace. Uh, Father said that it always begins with God. He, he proposes like a new faith. It's up to us to respond. But the church always works with, with the culture. And even King Philip and the royal injunction said, whatever is the culture is, Work within the culture when you Christianize. Accept their festivities, their rituals, as long as they do not contradict Christian faith. So there had always been a respect for culture. And even if, even Pope Francis today in his uh, Laudato Si encyclical, it's always a respect for what is there already in nature and in human nature as well. So he quotes... Uh, uh, Francis of Assisi, respect for the sun, brother fire, sister water, and all the preachers 
especially human beings. In the culture of human beings, ours was just one. No, we were we had our own uh, budul budul and. For example, in other Christian cultures, for example, in Japan, they have this beautiful culture of what, what, We had a beautiful, they have a beautiful culture that's called wuwe or wabi-sabi. It just means, wabi means accept what is there, its reality, but do not be attached. And Sabi, accept the passing of time and the age, the, the cracked vase, for example, that has been repaired. You know, acceptance of the brokenness of Kintsugi. things because nothing is permanent. Yes. And the brokenness of people as well. So that's a very beautiful starting point for faith because our faith accepts us as sinners, broken people. So it T taken from that, from that philosophy, ph philosophical ethic of the Japanese, acceptance, uh, um, acceptance of, of the age, for example, and brokenness, and the beauty of something that is repaired and recycled. All these are part of, of you know, um, okay, acceptance and the realization of that is nature, and the faith works with that. For example, the the idea of of ma something the quietness during conversation when you converse there's quiet quietness uh, there has to be quiet in between he he can apply that in architecture when you design architecture you can have spaces within buildings that are quiet and silent so in japan they have this little garden inside the 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 beauty of the stillness and silence of poetry, for example, or of conversation, is where the culture of Japan says reality is, or even God is. So that can also be an entry point no? uh, for, for Christianity to come in. That's why you had so many martyrs in Japan after they accepted Christianity, 20 kapin, 23 in one massacre. No? So there are very beautiful aspects of our culture, including what we did and what other cultures in Asia do about acceptance and humility and respect for stillness and the gaps, you know, in, in spaces where, where, where grace can enter and, and God can work as starting points. These are seeding areas or, you know, where, where things can start. And you are, somebody said that, questionable, of course, when Humabon and, and the followers were, were baptized, I don't think they really understood catechism enough that, uh, you know, we can say they really appreciated Christianity deep enough. But, but of course, friendship and political alignment also came into the picture, no? But I think when God comes in, he doesn't leave it all to us. Grace always comes with it. And so the acceptance, I, I would say, was also the work of God, as Father said. Yes, okay, thank you so much. thank you very much. Thank you so much. By the way, before we accommodate our next participant, we would like to acknowledge that Sir Aaron, James Veloso, is still with us virtually. If you also want to ask him a question, you can just mention his name. All right, last question from the audience. Yes, please. Uh, good afternoon, Father, architect, and doctor. Well, uh, my question is simply asking your opinion, so I will have no, I will have no follow up. You, 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 uh, the three of you talked about beauty and, and, and architecture and how it represents, for example, in Father's um, talk, he, how it elevates the, the human spiritual journey to, towards the divine. And we, we know for a fact that the medieval churches, the churches in the Renaissance, and even the churches just before contemporary, the contemporary age, they were beautiful, and as Father said, they, they each design has symbolizes an aspect of catechism or, or of our spiritual journey. But it does seem to me that the churches now are a lot more minimalistic, plain, and then geometrically, uh, geometrically plain, and their aesthetic just is around the texture of the material and so on. It doesn't really, there's, there's no statues and stuff like that. And in, in your opinion, is that, is that a harmless trend in architecture, is, or is it 
uh, does it represent a fundamental loss in understanding beauty, for example? That's, that's it. Actually, when it comes to the sacred arts, the church um, does not set a blueprint. That means the church is not only accepting um, Gothic as uh, the only expression of sacred art. The church does not only canonize um, um, the Baroque no? uh, genre in which the Spaniards uh, brought that uh, genre here in the Philippines as the only one that can uh, elevate the mind and the soul to the divine. However, the church would only set guidelines of how to make spaces of worship something that inspires, um, teaches, and catechizes. However, if there are churches now being built with such kind of genre, this is not a really a mandate uh, per se of the church, but this is just one of the many expressions, be it in the cultural pattern of the people or be it the product of the time, but the church does, does not have a blueprint of how to create her, her churches to be as such, no? And just to make mention of our separated brethren, di man iglesia ni Cristo nga, if you see one, you see all, no? Nga, pero ang katulikong simbahan, nag-agad ni sa Espiritu Santo, no? Mayingon siguro tag, gamay rin sila Espiritu Santo, na dawat kay sa kinik, kay mas nindot may lang simbahan. Siguro, that could also be possible, no? Or kaning kani simbahan na kani parokyahan ng resist siguro ni Espiritu Santo kaysa kini parokya nga beautiful juga ayo. But there are objectifications of what beauty is all about. That is why comes the hierarchy, no? The standards of beauty, the standards of iconography, the 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 guidelines of uh, the liturgical liturgical atmosphere, and all the many guidelines come into one. Lit liturgy, theology, ecclesiology, and even the canons of the church are all manifestation of the structure of the church. That is why um, naroon mga movement after the contemporary that nga maingon sila nga ang contemporary is reductionism. They fear of using signs and symbols where in fact this is where the sacred arts is so very heavy, the iconographic programs. Nga reductionism, no? daghan kayo o planar compared to vo uh, volumes or sculptural volumes in the church. No? Uh, kaysa ato makitan before sa mga barok o rococo, nga wa, jay, flat in mo makitan. There are all volumes of sculptures, uh, paintings, and work of arts. But the church, sa ako nagigan, no bl blueprints, but this is always the product of the conversations of so many aspects, faith, culture, hierarchy, no? and even taking into consideration indigenous materials, techniques, engineering. No? Nga kining tanan, kabahi ni sa conversation sa usa ka lugar, sa di pa sila mohimo o ilahang balay alampuanan. And in such a way, every church speaks of the identity of the people. Never a copy, never a kind of a uh, a replica of other churches, but something that is unique, something that is uh, individuated, something that they can claim that this is their own. Okay. <clears throat> a certain author called Michael Rose wrote a book about the churches, some churches today. He said, they are ugly. <laughs> <laughs> he was talking about churches that are just square or rectangle and without any iconography or decoration at all. There are so many new churches now that are products of Vatican II, but it was not the intent of Vatican II that it should go in that direction. But misinterpretations of Vatican II led to some designers, some priests, some architects to design in a way that they interpret as the new church. There are two approaches now, and there should not be. But some, some parishes see, or some priests see, the liturgy, the mass, as basically a sacrifice. Others, other pastors, see it as a meal, a coming together. Okay? So depending on how you see, 
your faith, your building will be interpreted in that way. So if you see it as a sacrifice of Jesus represented in the altar during the consecration especially, where God is present again, body, blood, soul, divinity, Father, no? You see it as sacrifice. Therefore, you make a building that is worthy of sacrifice and that worships. I mean, a building that brings you to the worshiping um, kind of posture no? or mode. If you, see, if you see religion or the mass as a meeting place, like in a communion, like the Last Supper, then you design a place that will bring in so many people coming together, clapping together, singing together, and receiving communion together. You will design a, a, a church that, that is more like a meeting place than a place of sacrifice. So now you have different designs of churches. We even see it in our own blessed San Pedro Calungsod near Seaside. Without the cross there, you would not imagine it as a church. It's just a series of walls. It's like a convention hall. I think it's a product of Vatican II. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying it's an approach maybe interpreted by the architect and the priest as, you know, a place of sacrifice, but also a meeting place like, 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 like this one, like this one. So um, there, are, there are, you know, uh, parameters that bring together a kind of a design based on how the main function is seen. But I think there should be no dichotomy, ideally, Father, no. It should be both sacrifice and because people are, we are a body, we come together, we meet there and offer the sacrifice together. So I think there should only be one. But basically, if personally as an architect, I would design a church in such a way that is worthy of a personal encounter among the God's people and God. I mean, if that encounter happens, I think that is what a church really is. I mean, if you're meeting with one another, that's also good because it's, we're all part of the church, no? And individually, God, but it's a communal, it's a communal act activity, Magyod, and liturgy, no? So if, if, if a space, if a design brings people together and leads them to an encounter with the divine, I think that's how a church should be, as an architect. Sir Aaron, are you still with us? Sir Aaron? Hi. Yes, sir. Would you like to answer the question raised earlier with regards to the what's your insight now that the church, of, church designs are becoming more minimalistic compared to those which, are, which were built way earlier? Well, thank you. No, uh, I think I have to put off my historian hat and re, uh, bring back my liturgist hat. You know, uh, that's a very long discourse. No, we will need hours and hours to answer the question. But I guess just drawing from both uh, architect Melva and Father Brian's uh, Brian's responses. No, uh, churches as all other products of human creativity and human culture speak of the time from which it, it came from, no? So uh, if churches now uh, look that way, I hope that they were designed uh, with the churchgoer in mind, meaning I hope it's something that they can relate to, something that is useful for them. Because at the end of the day, whether it's Baroque or Gothic or, or Brutalist or Postmodernist, uh, the purpose of the church really is to facilitate worship. So it, uh, uh, different sets of people would have different ideas of what a church should look like. And certainly there are many places where they could go and worship. I myself have several, uh, several personal choices. No, uh, I must admit sometimes it makes me, it makes it difficult for me to, to, go to Mass in a very modern church. I just couldn't reconcile looking at a, at a sculpture made of wire uh, made to represent Jesus. No, But again, uh, it's a product of human creativity and I suppose it may not speak for me, but it speaks for other people. Uh, so hopefully that space will facilitate 
uh, worship for uh, a particular kind of people, a particular set of people. That being said, as uh, architect Melva mentioned earlier, I hope that is always tied to the idea of you know res- respecting what is already there uh, in terms of heritage. No, uh, even in among the Vincentian family, no, it's uh, it's always a problem when a priest, for example, or a sister would like to change. Uh, an existing chapel or an existing church, uh, sometimes not uh, wholly inspired by by the pastoral needs of the people. No? So sometimes I think uh, a good question would be, uh, is what I have now already facilitating liturgy? And is what I want to do going to improve it or deter people from actually facilitating that encounter with God. So, siguro yun lang yung mga questions sa, yung mga questions sa liturgy ang hirap yan ng sagot na yes or no eh. But always, it's, uh, it's a pastoral approach uh, to help facilitate the encounter between God and people and also respect for, uh, for our heritage, for what is already existing. And also respect for the preferences of other people who might find certain architectural styles uh, inspirational or uh, something that can help them pray better. So, yun. Thank you so much, Sir Aaron, for sharing your thoughts. So at this part, the question will be coming from me. <laughs> so I know that all of the our speakers for today are coming from different fields. We have Father from the church, Architect Melva from the industry on you know architecture slash engineering. We have Dr. Berenaga from the academe, and we also have um, Sir Aaron coming from a government agency. My question would be, given all your presentations, it made us all realize that Visayas is so rich with cultural properties and built heritage, which tells the history and the story of Filipino spirituality. My question is, what are we doing to capacitate our fellow practitioners in their respective fields? For example, for the church, uh, what are we doing to capacitate the priest? For example, the uh, architect Hava, what are we uh, doing to capacitate fellow architects and the like? To, so that we can you know, um, strengthen our efforts for culture and heritage preservation. So let's start with from the academe because we are at the university. Yeah, thank you for the questions in terms of uh, ano, promoting knowledge about Visayan culture, especially pre-colonial cultures, kay, uh, kana, ang NHCP as well as the NCCA put, and uh, I for one am a member of one of the national committees on historical research, the NCCA, and that's part of the uh, mandate board and the advocacy of uh, agencies like the NCCA for us to learn more about who we were before Christianization, before colonization. Kay, uh, di- di even now, we still see elements that uh, can be traced back to the pre-colonial times, including di ba, the power of women or ang, uh, isagang mga LBGTQIA sa unang, uh, uh, they were the ones, we, old women or mga gays, sila ang mga priests before, they were the spirit mediums, no, mga babaylans or asog. And uh, it was the chroniclers who made us aware about these people in the past. Uh, so that's part of the uh, challenge. Nga we uh, research about research. Uh, our culture and no more. Kay, uh, the, color, the missionaries, they didn't preach uh, in a vacuum. Diba? There was already a pre-existing uh, culture, uh, pre-existing uh, uh, society that received these new ideas and made it their own. Thus, even though the Spaniards uh, are gone, uh, well, we are now independent, pero the Santo Nino, uh, Roman Catholicism remains strong. Okay? It was built on uh, nanay ground in which it was laid and introduced to the uh, Filipinos and the Visayans. Thank you, Sir Bo- Dr. Borinaga, and I hope that our students, are you still listening, students? Oh, he mentioned research. So we need more writers that will study our history. So since Dr. Borinaga mentioned the word NCCA, so 
Uh, before we proceed to our two on-site speakers, Sir Aaron? Sir Aaron? Yes, yes. It, okay, it's your uh, time to answer the question. One of the things that I am very particular about is writing 20th century history. No, uh, As a church historian, my field, my uh, interest really is to write uh, the history of the church in the 20th century. It might seem very familiar, but in fact, there is already a dearth of resources, primarily because uh, Filipinos aren't as masinop as the Spaniards in uh, record keeping. No, So uh, it takes a lot of effort now to write history about the 20th century, third, uh, 20th century church. And in Cebu and in other parts of the Filipino, there are a lot of stories to, to discover, for example, about how uh, as I mentioned, how about, how, about, uh, how uh, the sisters contributed to uh, the growth and the development of, uh, of the Philippine Church. But also, for example, the lay movement uh, in Cebu, the Action Catolica in the 1900s uh, was very strong. No? There are a lot of things that we need to look at and uh, discover and uh, read about and write, hopefully, so I hope, uh, as uh, Dr. Borinaga mentioned, no, new generations of scholars will will be born and that they will be interested to write about all of these things and also to protect uh, the existing uh, our existing heritage, whether it be in uh, built structures, like the things that uh, both uh, Architect Hava and uh, Father Brian takes care, but also in other forms, like in our intangible heritage, for example, in... Our spiritual intangible heritages are very rich and uh, in many parts of the Philippines, it's slowly uh, getting lost uh, to time and modernism. The same also in terms of our uh, archival heritage, our movable heritage uh, in, in the church. So, so there are a lot of things that we can, we can work on and it really takes an interested group of people to to begin to work uh, on this. So I hope you know, that uh, opportunities such as this would become the spark that will help uh, more generations of young scholars and heritage lovers and uh, activists to pick up the invitation and actually work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sir Aaron. Let's move on to Architect Hava. Hello. Okay, this one works. Thank you, Michi. Uh, in answer to your very good question, uh, we, can, we can do in, in our individual professions quite a lot. For example, in what I do as an architect, I was also with academe. We created a division in the University of San Carlos School of Architecture. It's called Cherish, Conservation of Heritage um, Workshop, uh, Studio and Workshop. Conservation of Heritage Studio and Workshop, short, in short, Cherish. And the, the academe, the students in Cherish, documented practically all of the churches all around Cebu Island. That documentation helped very much, not only in Cebu, but in Bohol, you know, as part of the Cherish output. That documentation helped a lot in the restoration of the churches after the earthquake. When we went to Bohol and we looked at, we looked at, thank you, we looked at some of the plans used by the contractors, we saw the work of Cherish there, we, we saw our signatures, and it became the, the reference on how to restore, because there was a documentation, architectural, um, historical, photographic, even archaeological, and it provided all the facts they needed to make the church stand again. So there's a lot that academe can do. And I've been telling my friends in other schools offering architecture, please train your students also because there's still a lot to be done in Cebu and elsewhere in the country. Documentation comes first because when you lose these things, you can easily retrieve the data and then you can reconstruct, if reconstruction is called for. That is when I was in academe. No? Um, I was former dean of the college and then I created this heritage because I really love heritage. After architecture, I took up anthropology because I'm really into the humanities more than the engineering side. Not, 
because I'm very poor in math. So that's <laughs> okay. Anyway, anyway, I love humanities, and I think in architecture, humanities is a very strong partner because you have to understand the people when you are building for the people. You have to understand their needs, and you have to sympathize with their needs. And you work with the engineers. The engineers are brilliant in academ uh, in, in in construction. So we partner with them. So we need them. So that's it in academ. In in the U United Architects of the Philippines, after Odette, our young architects, together with our group from the NCCA, because I'm also with the NCCA, went to the sites in Cebu that were, that was, who were hit by the, by the, by the Odette, by, by Typhoon, the roofs, for example, of Sibonga. Um, convent was just blown off entirely, not just the, not just the sheets, but including the framing. So our, our UAP group brought their own drone and then we documented, we, 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 we did a rapid assessment so that uh, the funding agencies and the technical people can go there and know what happened. So that was a, a what we call it a rapid assessment and then we, we prioritized the, the bigger uh, damages to be attended to first. No? Then as part of the my memberships at Chucks, <laughs> LGU, because I'm also, a, I'm also. You're wearing tasked. so many hats. <laughs> no, I'm tasked, but it's all related to heritage conservation. I was tasked by the mayor to be member, Kamini Father, to be member of the Cultural and Historical Affairs Commission. One of the things that we created was a module, a training module. We just finished last week. It was a seven-week module where we brought in the barangays mm -hmm. after, the after the ordinance declaring the heritage precinct of Cebu. We looked at the barangays included in that precinct and then we invited the barangays and the city uh, parks and playgrounds people and some the engineering people to attend a seven week le lecture, mm -hmm. seminar workshop on what conservation is, what are the, cons the heritage places in Cebu, uh, how to identify them from pre-Spanish to Spanish to American to modern and what to do with them at the level of, you know, very basic maintenance and cleaning. And we want to, to uh, repeat that module by February, this time on a deeper level, we want to, to show them how to identify the pathologies and what to do. And then, um, Finally, in church, I'm a member of Father Brian's <laughs> commission. We are also looking into the churches, the different parishes, especially in response to times when they call. And Father Brian is always there ahead of us, and sometimes he calls us to join, to join him. And we try to also to explain to the parish priest why this or that should be done or this should not be done. No? Sometimes, again, the priest, Father Lisud, no? in town, ideas. So these are the things that were involved in uh, as a profession, from academe to the LGU to the. But most importantly, what we're doing, such as the community. We want to reach to the, com the com to the community because it's not only the experts, not the researchers only, not the architects or the engineers only, but the community itself is the very important component of heritage preservation. Thank you, Mom. Thank you, architect. Finally, Father. In the church level, uh, we always see that the church will always have a high regard of her artistic and historical patrimony, you know, that the cultural assets of um, structures, architectures, paintings, murals, the artistic and historical patrimony. However, coming from the hierarchy of the church, the church is always there to protect these things because these are tools for evangelization. If these things are no longer there, then that would also mar fundamentally the church. And that is why from the hierarchy, we have the Pontifical Commission for the Cultural Heritage of the Church. In the Archdiocesan level, we have the Archdiocesan Commission for the Cultural Heritage of the Church where both of us, Mamelva, are working together and even in the parish level there is also the parochial um, committee or commission for the cultural heritage of the church whose mandate is to protect the cultural asset of the church as tool for evangelization 
and that comes from the proper and scientific conservation efforts. No, dili lang kutob o unsay gusto ni Father kung dili magagi musunod yud o mga polisiya universally accepted policies. No, in order to perpetuate their significance and value, not to eradicate them, not to abolish them, or just a a pigment of the past's memory. Nga naapatay mapa imana sa sunod nga mga mga hinirasyon. Ug mo ni among trabaho, muramig mga police, no? Nga what is authentic should always be respected. What is authentic should always be there in order to tell us the significance, the story, because that's really imbued and saturated with so much story about who the people are their journey of faith no and it comes with a lot of many mandates policies activities periodical uh, events nga para nako way kahumanan mo na nga kada tuig dagang kay buhok mga tangtang sa kung o tungod ni ining dako kaayo nga nga kaning tulumanon siguro kaning pariparihan ako dako sa gaynig obligations kinabuhi no we at the managerial level, we always in need of the cooperation of the faithful in order for us to really be true to the mandates of the conservation and the perpetuation of the cultural assets of the church as a tool for evangelization. All right, thank you so much to all our speakers for today's Amistad Duradera Lecture Series Part 2. We truly learned so much and gained new insights. So we'd like to show, of course, our appreciation for your, all your inputs. May I call on on stage Reverend Father Leander Barro together with Mr. Alvin Alcid to present our certificates as well as of tokens of appreciation. These tokens will be awarded to our afternoon speakers. First, we have Reverend Father Brian C. Brigoli from the Archdiocese of Cebu. Let's wait for Father. I hear Father. <laughs> Also, we'd like to acknowledge our virtual speaker, Mr. Aaron James Arveloso. A round of applause for him, please. Sir, as for your certificate of tokens, we will send it to you courtesy of NHCP. At, so, picture first. And now, can I ask our two speakers, um, Architect Hava, as well as Dr. Borinaga, to join us in a photo opportunity. And also, I'd also like to acknowledge once again Professor Delilah Labajo, who was her here earlier today. So a round of applause for all our resource speakers. At this part of our program, we are now about to conclude. To give us the synthesis and closing remarks of today's affairs, I would like to call in the President of the Secretariat of Spirituality, Charism, and Permanent Formation. Reverend Father Leander Barot, OAR. Maying hapon kaninyong tanan. Maying hapon. On the occasion of the Friendship Day between sa Spain and Philippines, I always remember our relationship sa pamilya. When we were young, tulumi ka buok, Elder ako, niya, youngest na mong daughter. Uh, kaming duha kaming laki, then we have a younger sister. During our younger days, sige raming away. <laughs> Labi na sa akong maguwang. There were conflicts, so forth and so on. But karong time, uh, 58 anos na ko. Pero okay pa kung buhok pa there. Wala taga yung daghang responsibilidad. In other words, wala taga yung daghang responsibilidad. Puti lang, puti lang. 58 niya akong elder brother, 60 years old na siya. Uh, and our parents are gone. Wala na away. In other words, we simply have matured. In other words, kining friendship theme of friendship really is about maturity, no? And like also relationship between Spain and and Philippines, it has gone through this. There are light shadows, there are negative and positive. 
and there are also conflicts. But since we have already matured, most of the negatives and the shadows are left in the footnotes. You know what I mean. When you work on your thesis, the footnotes are only notes, but the major story is the main line. And thank you for the speakers because they have highlighted precisely the main stories. Many things we've received from this relationship are faith, culture, heritage. These we don't place in the footnotes. We place these in the main story. Or for those who are doing thesis, it's not an easy thing, but the main stories and the highlights, we place them. And this, precisely this activity, is one like this, that we recall back the things, the good things we received from the past, from those who came before us. But the challenge is to cherish, protect, but most importantly, to move forward and learn from this. We have to embrace our past. We have to embrace the people and understand the people who came before us so that we can appreciate more who we are and we move forward with graciousness and with much sense of gratitude. To our speakers, Nakuilista Handri, Architect Melva Java, Asa na tong page to? Ano wa? Ah, Professor Delaila Labajo, Reverend Father Brian Briguli, Mr. Aaron James Veloso, thank you for bringing back to our memory, our heritage, our culture, and this is the challenge for us to keep them alive in our hearts and in our consciences. Thank you. God bless. Adelante. Thank you so much, Father Barot. Wow, now we are finally coming to a close. Did you learn something? Yeah. Wow, well, can I hear a louder yes if you learned something for today? Yeah. Wow, but since it's uh, Philippine Spanish Friendship Day, can I hear a C? Si? Si. Oh, okay, that's, uh, that's more convincing. So first, thank you so much for allocating your time here at the university it's actually our mental health day so they can they are actually free to choose what they want to do but they still chose to be with us here for this session so first thank you so much to our on-site participants that's for the usjr participants now we also have here the different faculty members of different colleges and universities let's give them a round of applause De lang obvious nga daghan kay ni sila gihuna huna kay na pa may murag pila raining ni pisang buhok. <laughs> Once again, this is Amistad Duradera Lecture Series. Feature our title is Faith and Humanity: The Visayas and Spain's Role in Filipino Spirituality. This is an official program of the Philippine Spanish Friendship Day. We'd also like to acknowledge that this is organized by the National Historical Commission of the Philippines in partnership with the University of San Jose Recoletos. We would also like our collaborator Cebu City's Cultural and Historical Office, Cultural and Historical Affairs Commission. Local Historical Committees Network. Thank you, thank you so much. Let's give them a round of applause. And of course, those are the ag agencies and organizations. We'd also like to say our special gratitude to Mr. Emmanuel Nadella for being one of our key sponsors. Thank you so much, Sir Emmanuel. And to everyone who joined us online from our morning session to afternoon session, daghan kaayong salamat. And I'm sure that you have learn quite a lot and i hope that you will replay and share this episode to a lot of your friends ladies and gentlemen one more time buenas tardes soy mitzi muchas gracias <laughs> now are we are ending our live stream i would like to acknowledge our guests led by our of course from NHCP, Mr. Alvin, to take center stage together with our speakers for a photo opportunity. For the rest of the participants on site, please stand so we can take a group picture together. First, sir, nakatalikud po kayo para nakita sila. Is Father Barot still around? Okay. 
From NHAP, also Sir Jerwil, Miss Anna, Mr. Nadella, please join us for a group photo. Dr. Borinaga. Okay. Okay, so, uh, okay, Naka naman sila so. First um, photo from you, ikaw sa sir, picture sa sila. Okay. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay, change for me, Sean. Okay, pala. For those who joined us on site, here is a reminder you can claim your certificates at the registration area after presenting your accomplished evaluation form.